Okay, good morning. Can I have so those in the back, can you, can you guys read, read properly? Do I need, okay, I shouldn't put the lights down. Okay, good. So uh, this is COM 401. Um, there are two sections, 001 and 002, and this is the 002 section. And my name is Prasoon Devan, and hopefully by the end of the semester I'll know some of your names, if not all. Um, so what I'll do today is, uh, as this title of this, of this slideshow shows, um, talk about what to expect in this course, both in terms of uh, the contents. Um, actually, I have a list of, list of items here. So what resources are available to you, um, how to get started, uh, before the, uh, things to do before the next class, what kind of there was a student who came to me at the start of the class saying, hey, I don't know if I have the right background or not. So we'll discuss the background issue in great depth. Um, we'll, you know, we'll get a flavor of what kind of topics you'll have uh, in this course and what kind of workload to expect and, and how to organize the class, which is actually a quite a tricky and complicated issue. Okay? So that's the goal. I don't know how long it will take. Um, maybe, um, and I'm, if, if we have time, I'll also talk about some of the software tools that will be available to help you learn. So, um, so that's the plan, okay? And uh, feel free to ask questions at any, any time. Um, and in fact, if you're answering or asking questions, just note that down um, because a large part of your grade will be class participation. So you might as well get uh, points uh, for that uh, on day one, okay? So the first thing to know is the course page. Um, I've got the URL here. Uh, but you, if you just Google my last name and COM 401, you should be directed to the page. Okay, so this page is important. You need to, it, it's, got, it's got links to everything else. So um, you need to find this. Okay, and if, if you, for some reason you still have problem, just send me mail and I'll send you the link. Okay. Um, anybody need time to take it down or can I go to the next slide? Okay. Um, one of, the, one of the links here that's important is the course syllabus in UNC format. Okay? So a lot of what I'm saying today um, is available in that document. So once you get to the page, look at that document in, in, in depth and um, you'll, you'll get a pretty good idea of, of the whole lecture today. Okay? Uh, another important link is the Piazza link. So uh, we will have face-to-face -face interaction, but um, you know, when you're stuck at uh, an odd hour in the night um, and you need help, Piazza is a great way to get help. And also, Piazza has the advantage that um, your answer is viewed by everybody else. So we don't have to repeat the answer again and again and again. Okay? So uh, sign up on Piazza uh, as soon as possible because all announcements will be made through Piazza, not through Sakai. Okay? Sakai, Sakai logs you off and it's, UI is not as good. So that's what we'll be using. Um, another important, uh, important uh, link there is the link, uh, link to the set of assignments. So um, the first assignment is due in a week and a half, and that seems pretty, uh, pretty unusual because I haven't even taught you anything. But this course has prerequisite, okay? So you're supposed to know some programming before you come in, and the first assignment just, just checks, does a sanity check and says, are you prepared or not, okay? So um, it is in Java, so if you haven't done Java, that's, you know, that's something you'll have to learn very quickly. Uh, that's mostly syntax. We won't be using Java's um, unusual concepts, object oriented, I, I shouldn't say unusual. We'll be using concepts in Java that are also in every other language, okay? So most of you have done object oriented programming to some degree, I believe. We, I'll take a poll soon. So, so go find the assignment, um, first assignment, and have a look at it at least. Uh, it won't take very long if you know what you're doing, and if you know Java especially, but it will take long if you don't know Java because there's some setup cost there. Okay, so question so far? Okay. Um, the course page is long. Okay, there's lots of information there. But at the very beginning, there's an index. So in that index, you have a link to assign assignments. So just, you know, if you can't find assignments, either search for assignments in the page or just click on that link. 
So um, how many of you have not done Java before? Very few. Okay. So um, those of you who haven't uh, in, done Java, please, um, and, and the rest of you too, if your computers are new, uh, download the JDK. JDK is what powers Java. Now, we don't use, you know, to compose programs in Java, we need what's called a programming environment. Okay? And how many of you have not used Eclipse? Just a few. Okay? So a programming environment is an environment that lets you go and compose your program, compile it, uh, run it. Okay? You can just use command line and a text editor to do so. How many of you have done that? Okay, so you are real programmers. Okay? Uh, as it turns out, uh, the programming environment offers many convenient features. So um, if you've used just the text editor and command interpreter, you know very well what's going on under the hood. Okay, that's great. And, and, uh, but you don't want to be always fixing your car. You want to be sitting back and letting cruise control go at some point. So Eclipse is a, is, is a tool that gives you, that has a lot of sophisticated commands to do sophisticated things. So uh, you have to install it and learn these commands. So those of you who have not done Eclipse, use Eclipse, please um, go and look through this PowerPoint and, and install it. Okay? And if you have trouble, there's, there's a bunch of us to help you. Help you. But try to do it on your own. Uh, Are you able to use like, mapping for the first difference? Okay, so um, I, I talked about two programming environments. I talked about just text editor and command line, I talked about Eclipse. And there are other alternatives. NetBeans is one of the alternatives. So um, you're allowed to use it, but you're not encouraged because I, I have built a lot of tools around Eclipse, and that will make it more convenient for you. If you. Those tools are optional. So if you really, really hate Eclipse, okay, and you want some other environment, you're free to use it, but Eclipse, you know, there are better environments than Eclipse. In some ways, they are more sophisticated. In NetBeans, it's a little less sophisticated, but maybe simpler. So there's trade-offs, and I'm not saying Eclipse is the best. It is, one of its advantages is that it's open source, and it's extendable. So I have extended it, okay? And the other environments are not as extendable. And, um, and it's a pretty nice environment. You know, if you go to industry, um, and you go to Microsoft, for instance, you'll be using Visual Studio. Uh, and Visual Studio is the industrial standard. And I've actually spent some time in Microsoft, and they always use Eclipse as a gold standard, saying, okay, we've got to keep up with Eclipse. So Eclipse is a good environment, but there are other environments too. And, and uh, the nice thing about it, like I said, is extendable, and I have extended it. If you want my extensions, use Eclipse. And, and the TAs and the LAs will be conversant with Eclipse mostly. So if you want help with the programming environment, again, um, that will be good. Okay. okay, other questions? Um, how many of you have used Git? Just a few. Now, if you ever go out for internships and jobs, people will say, where's your Git project? Okay. So what is Git? Git is this cloud-based, everything is cloud computing nowadays. So your source code also you can keep in the cloud. And you know, keeping in the cloud has many advantages. You can uh, have, a, have a good backup. Um, keeping in the cloud also allows you to share code. And so that's something you get with Google, Google Drive and Dropbox and so forth. But Git is meant for programs and textual data. So it'll actually keep not every, it'll keep multiple versions of your code. So you can always roll back and say, okay, let me go back to that stage. So if, you, if you've done something bad, you can undo it. Okay? And, and it keeps only the differences. It doesn't keep the whole text. So that's roughly what Git is. And uh, we'll be using Git. You don't have to keep your projects in Git. In fact, I'd rather you don't make them public because we repeat projects from semester to semester. And that'll, by not keeping it public, that will discourage plagiarism. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to be giving you code that you will bring into your Eclipse environment. So you have to share code with me. Okay? And I'll keep changing the code. So you need to use Git to get my code the, fir the first time, and then keep getting the changes. So that is why Git is important. So even if, if you go for internships later, and even if you don't have your own Git project, you can say, well, I know how to use Git. I know how to pull changes that somebody else has made. OK? 
Okay? So that's going to be an educational experience in its own right. So um, please, those of you, uh, you know, go, go to this particular link and um, learn how to use Git and learn how to pull the code I already have there. Okay? Do that before the next class, ideally. Okay? And if you have trouble, we'd help you. But if you don't have trouble, it's good that uh, you could do it on your own. Okay? You, didn't, you didn't need our resources. Okay? Now, um, a student came to me earlier and said, you, you know, I know Python, I don't know Java. And Python, Java, you know, there's some, there's some differences. Python lets you get away with more things before you run the program. Uh, but essentially, they're, 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 they, they are similar in many ways. So it's just syntax that changes. Okay? So you go from one language to the other language. In, in, in a natural language, you go from one language to another language in programming language. Okay, so I've actually looked at Python code. I kind of understand it. I've never written Python code because, you know, languages don't change very much. So, um, um, if, you, if, you, if, you need, if you know a language that, if you, if you know a programming language, which I hope you all do, that's a prerequisite, then there's one PowerPoint on the relevant Java syntax. It tells you, okay, this is how the for looks like. This is what if looks like. This is how you declare a method. You know, things you have in every language, it'll tell you the syntax, write syntax for that. Okay? So that's something you should look at if you've never done Java. Okay? There's only a handful of you. And please don't get discouraged, okay? Uh, just because you don't know Java, uh, shouldn't be a reason to leave the class, okay? Uh, as I'll talk about, uh, as I'll mention later, this class is not about Java, okay? Not all about Java, at least. You can't avoid some language-specific things. Uh, so, so don't get discouraged, okay? Um, and um, this is before next class. For the next assignment, you should also look at, um, I, I won't go back there. Uh, there was a link on the scanning. So if you want to sort of look at that, um, for, for, the, for the assignment, um, that's, that's a link you should also follow. So let's talk about Java versus non-Java. So some of you haven't done Java, and, and uh, that's kind of okay. It, it, you just there's a bigger, bigger learning curve for you, at least in terms of syntax. And when I say the course is not about Java, I really mean that we're trying to get at the underlying concepts, concepts that will also apply to Python, also apply to C Sharp, especially C Sharp. Um, because that's more in the spirit of Java, but it's just a different, different company blesses it. And, 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 and just an indication of the fact that this is not only about Java, we'll be in fact banning certain things that Java has, libraries, okay? So we'll be restricting you to a very small set of Java. And that small set overlaps a lot of the other languages. Okay, so that's an indication that we're not just about Java. We're using Java as a vehicle, but this course is not making you a proficient Java program. Okay? So what is this about then? Uh, okay, so that's Java versus Java. Now Python is an object-oriented language. Okay? Some of you might have seen use C before. C is not object-oriented. Okay? Now Java happens to be object-oriented. Okay? And we will focus a lot on object-oriented concepts. Okay? If you haven't done object-oriented before, you are at a slight disadvantage. Um, Actually, you might, you might even be at an advantage because, because I will repeat everything that has to do with objects in this class. So those who have done object-oriented before might just kind of go to sleep and then, you know, they won't wake up in time to really get the hard concepts. There's, whereas those of you who haven't done object-oriented will keep awake, will be a little scared and sometimes being scared is good. Okay? So, so um, but this is what I expect you to know already. Okay? You should know what a type is. Okay, you should know what variables are, what it means to assign an expression to a variable. Okay, so you need to know about assignment and expressions. What a constant is, literal is, what a named constant is, which is a value that's associated with a name, it doesn't change. Conditionals, if, switch, but if is the main thing. Um, loops, now there are two kinds of loops. One kind of loop is a loop that knows how many steps to do when it's, when it's first executed. And there are other loops where the loop doesn't even know how many times it will repeat. Sometimes it may just go infinitely many uh, uh, when it starts. Okay? So I'm calling the other kind event-based. So if you don't know event-based loops, you're going to be in trouble, especially in the first assignment. Okay? So uh, go, go, go refresh your, you know, go look, look them up um, and, and, uh, and maybe get, just get practice through, uh, through the first assignment. Okay? So that's going to be a cause of hardness for those of you who haven't seen. And I know some classes don't teach event-based loops. They just teach you for loops where you just know how many times the loop will go at the start. 
Okay? And that's, that's, that's fairly simple compared to the other kind. Okay? She knows the fact that there's an input and output, the exact syntax changes from language to language. Um, you need to know how to collect variables together into arrays or strings. Okay? And if you don't quite know strings, well, ar strings are like arrays, they're arrays of characters. Okay? The first assignment is all about strings. Okay, so those of you who have never seen strings before, have seen arrays before, go and look at the relevant Java material that I've referenced and see how strings work, <coughs> internalize that. That's going to be a learning. Uh, that's something you'll have to learn. Okay? Functions, procedures, methods, they're all synonyms more or less. You have to know how these work. Okay? That's, that's, that's considered something difficult in CS1 programming. Okay, so if you don't quite understand them, you're really not going to be able to build. We're not going to have much time to talk about them in this class. So that's something you really need to know. And I know that's something, having taught CS1, that's something that's a little difficult to master. When I teach CS1, I teach, the very first day I teach them procedures and methods because I want that ingrained in there. That's something that's hard to master, so let's learn them early. Okay? So you need to know that and, you know, comments. Okay? So that's, that's something I'm sure all of you have seen before. So that's what you need to know. Now, um, how do you learn this stuff? Well, some of you have taken a formal course. If you've taken a formal course, especially at UNC, that's good. If you haven't done a formal course, people come to me and say, I have experience programming. I have written stuff that works. Okay? And my experience is that have not, uh, just pure experience doesn't get you very far in this course. Okay, when you try to get something to work, you can use libraries that are already provided. You can consult Stack Overflow. You sometimes don't have to know what you're doing. Okay? So just because you've got experience is not enough. And a lot of times people come into this class because Comp 110, which is the prerequisite in this. Comp 110 is the course in this university that, off, that satisfies the prerequisites. That sometimes fold. They said, well, let's try 401. So um, about 10 or 20% of the class just drops after the first assignment, okay? Uh, so um, you're welcome to, the, the first assignment is meant to be weeding out assignments, so you're welcome to try it out and see whether you have, a, uh, you can do it. If you can do it, you're, you belong to the course, okay? Uh, but again, let me warn you, the experience itself is not gonna be enough, I, I suspect. Okay, it depends on the person, of course, and how, what experience you've got. So again, like I said, uh, there will be repetition for those of you who know programming, um, object-oriented programming, but we'll go in more depth, okay? So, you know, learning object-oriented programming, I'm still learning object-oriented programming, okay? <coughs> so you never quite get it. So, uh, so don't be worried that you know too much, okay? Questions so far? Did I answer your question? Okay, good. Uh, so what are we gonna do in this course? Okay, 110 is the course that I said in this university uh, satisfies the prerequisites. And 410 is the course that follows this, okay? And um, now this is a required course. One of the problems with required courses as a teacher is that students never even think about what they're gonna expect here. And, and that's, that's sometimes bad. It's good, it's, good to, it's good if you've come to this class because you wanted to learn the topics, not because somebody said, you have to take this class, okay? Because then you do a little bit more thinking about what to expect, and, and then you can match expectations to what you actually get. So let's go through this exercise if you haven't gone through your, it yourself. So what do you think we'll learn in this class? So I mentioned object-oriented programming. I said we'll learn that. And what is object-oriented programming? It has concepts of classes which bunch together functions, and there's other things like inheritance. And so we learn object-oriented programming. Okay, that's sort of one way to put uh, put this. Now, those of you who did 110, did, did you learn classes and functions? How many of you did 110? A lot of you. So all of you learned that. So what do you guys think we'll, we'll, we'll learn beyond that? Or why are we learning, you know, what's the meta goal that is being satisfied by teaching you object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming is a mechanism to meet some goal. 
So what's the overall goal of this course? Yeah. I would assume being able to program more complex programs. Okay. Very good. Simpler code. So, so as you go ahead in your programming courses, you learn to uh, program more complex code. Okay. So that's one thing. We will learn how to do more complex things. Any other goal? Yeah. Okay, so we are, we are sort of getting three answers that together are, are giving you the whole elephant here. So com more complex, object-oriented, and what is why object-oriented? Because we want to reuse code, we want modularity, so that is the goal. And if we have modularity and, and, and re reusability, maybe we can do more complex code. Okay, anything else? So how to group things together, that's modularity. How to reuse code, again, you can reuse full groups together, you know, and, and that's, that gives you reusability. Yeah. And how to approach a problem using a computer science mindset? So how to think. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people say, oh, what is the goal of this course? To teach you how to think. And, and, and a lot of computer scientists do that and, and think formally is what they're trying to say. But you know, every course, whether it's philosophy or whether it's even writing, you know, they'd like to say that they teach you how to think, especially in the liberal arts. So I, you know, as computer scientists, I resonate with that, but trying to be balanced here, that uh, there's, there's other courses that can also do that. But yes, you know, to try to approach, and that's important, you know, because I always feel a course is not about teaching you information, it's teaching you how to teach yourself, okay? To me, that is the goal. How can I make, how can I, how can I make sure that after this class, you can still keep learning using maybe something you learned from this course, okay? Anything else? Okay, so let's get it, you know, let's just summarize that. So 110 is introductory programming, okay? So 410 is called data structures. So if we had to give a nice, nice two-word two description, we'll call it intermediate programming, whatever that means. Okay, and we've kind of seen what that means. And here's the deal. You know, you talk about complexity. So my view is that in 110, you learn how to write a small number of simple code fragments. Okay? Now, in the remaining courses, you're going to learn how to write a small number of complex fragments. It'll still be small. It'll be a few lines of code that we will analyze to death and, and make you understand, and that'll be very relevant, very important for you. And you know, data structures is one of them. We'll try to figure out you know, what are alternative ways to represent the same information, what are the efficiency considerations there, how can you formally um, specify them. So yes, we will do complexity because we will do, a, we will, I will let you do a large number of code fragments. But each code fragment will be still very simple. So in that respect, it's not complexity. Okay? So, um, so that's what I've got in this graph, that com complexity versus number of components. And the complexity will be a little bit more than 110. But the real goal is to make you write large programs. And that's why we need reusability and grouping. And that's why we need object orientation, because those are concepts that are, that, that, that are needed for that. Now, data structures, when I did data structure decades ago, we didn't have any object-oriented language. But we still learned all the concepts that, you, that you're learning today. Okay, you learned about trees and graphs and how to analyze them and what is big O. So that, those concepts are independent of object orientation. It's nice to use object orientation to build your implementation. But I use a language called Pascal, which is, you know, which was the, the language you learn at that time. So, so this course will really exploit the object orientation in an object-oriented language. Okay? And that is why object-oriented programming is going to be important. Now you might, you know, you learned classes in, in 110, but maybe you learned just, just, just how they work conceptually. You didn't, never really, you didn't exploit the, them, them completely. Okay, like I said, I'm still learning how to exploit them completely. Okay? So that is a never-ending process. And you're not going to, this is not going to be the be-all of learning object orientation. But it'll take you a step further. Okay? Questions so far? Okay. So, you know, taking small pieces of code that can, you can put on a blackboard and analyze for half an hour and really get the light bulbs 
going in the is is fun is challenging it's what we do in academics or not teaching someone to write a large number of programs is messy complex i still don't know how to do it we're going to spend a lot of time discussing all the things you know all the alternatives and what we're going to do so this is rare okay it's rare in the country okay so when, when a lot of people say can we test out of 401 and because we've done this somewhere else and almost invariably they haven't done it anywhere else okay so this is quite unusual uh, for, for to, to, to do okay so that's why I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining what it is we're going to do before we start doing things okay so it makes for a very different kind of course that makes for a lot of explanation so does that make for a difficult course so at the start of this course I got an email from a faculty member saying uh, I have been told that this is uh, the fourth hardest course in the university. And as, as, as the message says, I don't know how they determine that. And maybe they determine that based on the course feedback you get. You know, you have to put how many hours you put in. But, you know, my experience is that about 20% of the class really fills the feedback. So I don't know how representative that was, <laughs> that is. But I'm going to make, take this remark seriously, okay, uh, because it is difficult for many. And what we're going to do today is um, identify what makes it difficult. And, and you know, since I received this mail, I, I, I did some introspection. And, and um, I've taken some steps to reduce the workload. And I'll, I'll justify them based on this remark. Okay? So what do you guys instinctively feel? Why do you think a course like this may be difficult? What may be the sources of difficulty? And use your 110 experience or whatever your course you took as, as a basis for thinking why this course might be difficult. Number of hours you put in to understand rather than you know. So number of hours you put in to understand the concepts, okay? And you know, you have to think about where do you think more hours go in understanding mathematics or understanding this course? Okay? And and my guess is that in mathematics, you spend a little bit more time trying to understand. Things. But yeah, you know, this is, this is abstraction. There's a lot of abstraction in this course, and that's not easy. If, if algorithmic thinking doesn't come naturally to you, you know, that's what you were saying too, um, you have to get used to it. You have to get used to the fact that, I mean, so what's the difference between algorithmic thinking and thinking? So thinking can be qu quite abstract. You know, I can write a document, I can write a paper that you read, and you will interpret many of the things that I left out. And maybe you might interpret things in ways that I didn't even intend. Okay, that's probably what happens to Shakespeare a lot. So uh, there's algorithmic th thinking. You've got to spell out each of these small steps. So I remember walking past the campus, and there was this student saying, I can't believe people take computer science. If you do one wrong step, you, you're, you're host, and you've got to go look and look through everywhere to see where that step was. And then I read a Daily Tarheel article saying exactly the same thing, and I was wondering if it was the same student I heard, and saying, you know, how can people do this for a living? That how can you take something that's so unforgiving, so stupid, if you will, uh, that it requires you to spell out all the steps? And, and then figuring out which step you messed out on is called what in computer science? Debugging. You guys know the origin of debugging? Why is it called debugging? Sorry, let me get, let me get you. Go ahead. Uh, in the old giant computers, they used to have like plots fly into the, uh, the big computer systems and they cause them to crash. So they were moths? Yeah. Yeah, so there was a transistor that was shorting because there was a bug. At least the story goes. Okay, and, and that was because there was a bug there. So they, they debugged it. So that's how the word debugging arises. So a woman called Grace Hopper, I believe, invented this term from Bell Labs. I know it was in Bell Labs. So, uh, so debugging is a big deal. Okay? And you know, in mathematics, you learn how to prove a theorem too. But what happens? There's no computer that's looking at your proof. It's the TA. If the TA misses your mistake, you're fine. If the TA doesn't, uh, it finds your mistake, well, they take maybe five points off saying, I know what they meant computer it either works or doesn't work 
And we know how much effort it goes into getting, doing debugging. So we know you could have tested it, but you didn't. So you lose a lot more points. In fact, we rely a lot on automatic testing. So debugging is going to take a lot of, takes a lot of time in general. And the more the number of lines you write, every line you write is potentially something you might have you know, been absent-minded about. And it's potentially something you could have made a mistake on. Okay, so that is why it's, it's, it's good to break things into small, small parts because then you divide and conquer. But that is one source of difficulty. Okay. Okay, anything else that you can think of? So that's, uh, this is a four credit course. Okay, so it's not three credit course. And the rule of thumb is that you should spend about twice the number of hours as the number of credits. Whether it's outside class or inside, including the class hours, it's kind of ambiguous when you look on the web. But so I'm saying eight to 12 hours outside class. And from what I've heard in other courses, it's hard to fill those eight to 12 hours, okay? Whereas in this course, there's no problem, okay? So, so that's what, uh, that's also, so, and, and this, this number varies. It depends on, depends on how preoccupied you were while writing program. It's always a small silly mistakes that, that cause problems. The conceptual ones, the difficult ones, that's why it's good to be scared. Because when you're scared, you, 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 do, you don't make mistakes. So most accidents happen when you're coming back home, not in foreign lands. So, so, um, so, uh, uh, so that's something you have to watch out for. Okay, now let's, let's maybe, maybe something has to do with concepts also. Maybe the concepts are hard too. Okay, and, and let's get to that. So after 110, there's a set of programs that you can write. Whether you have the maturity to write or not is another issue. But you know enough concepts to write a set of programs. Will we, can you use these concepts? And this is, here's the question I'm posing. Will we learn to write new kinds of programs? Another way to say this is, are the concepts you learned enough to write any program in the any program at all? Anything? Can you quote any algorithm that somebody might might think of using what you've learned so far? What do you guys think? No. Yes. So, uh, how many of you think yes? Okay. Why do you think yes? I worked for a biotech company this summer. Yeah. Okay, and you were able to? Yeah, I, I think that I could replicate what we So at least through one example, one concrete real world example, you know that you feel empowered. And you're wondering, is this going to be a waste of my time, this class or not, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Somebody else who said yes? Uh, I, want to get, I want to get somebody who has not raised their hand first. Yeah, uh, you've raised your hand. Somebody else? Okay, let me get you. So that's very good. You know, mathematics tells you about the power of various calculus. You know, is this calculus as strong enough as that one? So the question is, you know, your instinct tells me, tells you that maybe what you've learned is, is the calculus that can be used to write arbitrary program, theoretically. Anybody else heard of a theoretical reason? Yeah, yeah. At the base level, maybe at the machine level? Everything gets down to the machine level. So if you're happy to program the machine level, it might take you a long time. It's that, right? And yeah. So, uh, I have coded dictators and uh, compilers, and all of them, they, they don't use any kind of complicated uh, concept. Everything is just simply loops and conditions. So you've coded a compiler to some degree, and you you know, so through just examples that you guys have done, you feel pretty empowered. <laughs> and you say, you know, and through uh, top down thinking, Look, everything gets down to the machine level is, is that, and, and through mathematical, you, your instinct tells you you can write any kind of program, it might take you a long time, okay? So in fact, one of the courses you'll take, I forget this number, it used to be called 181, will show you that what I've got in, capital, in, in bold there is theoretically enough to do any program in the world, okay? And that's a language that's, uh, you, might, you guys might have seen the movie um, about Alan Turing, I forget what the name was. The repetition? Imitation. Imitation game, right, right. So Alan Turing is 
there's a Turing, t you know, everything. He come, came up with a Turing machine, which has a few operations that can be used to code any algorithm. And a programming language is almost a Turing machine. Actually, it's not quite. Because programming languages, because computers have finite memory, they can't quite do any, everything. You know, Turing machine has infinite memory. It's called a tape. So, but modulo that fact, okay, we can do any program. So it might take us a long time. We might not have the maturity to do so. We might make a lot of errors doing so. But we will not learn new kind of uh, uh, programming concepts. And we won't even learn new algorithms. Okay? So what will we learn? So what you've learned in CS1 is more than sufficient to create uh, write arbitrary programs. So again, from scratch, nobody writes from scratch. If you're going to write an Android application, you've got to use an Android operating system and an Android toolkit. Using, if you're writing an iPhone application, you've got to use their structure. Now, you do need to be educated as to what structure there is so that you can fit your programming. Okay? What you've learned in 1.10 is not enough. You've got to learn something more. That something more is going to be part of, some of that stuff is going to be part of what I teach you. Okay? And so we will learn how to program quote unquote well. Not new algorithms, okay? But learn how to program well. Okay, and that sounds good. It's like saying, okay, we'll teach you grammar in English. That's 110, let's say. And then we'll teach you how to write. Okay? And ideally, you want to learn how to write. Okay? You want to learn to write things that people will read, not just write things that the word says has no grammar mistakes. Okay? Now, is that, so that's good, right? How can you argue against that? Is that somewhat scary? Maybe that causes some of the hardness problems that, that have been reported. So can you see what's scary about this? So the idea is not that you, when your program, when I give you an assignment, just because it works, just because the input output are correct is not enough. We'll go and see how you got the input or not. And hopefully what we're teaching is, you know, what people accept in the in industry and, and academics. So what's the, what's, what's the scary part here? Yeah. yeah you can't know just because you, like, finish your program. Like, you, you need to, like, you're done, you need to know how to express it in ways that anybody who goes through the code can interpret it. So it gets, so, you know, the, 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 the correctness check test is much more complicated. You just can't look at the input output. There's all these other considerations, and you may not even feel secure about it. So how many of you were asked to comment in your previous class? And were your comments really checked, do you think? Did you feel confident about the way you had commented? You felt just, you, you might have over-commented just, just in case? Yeah. You came, when, when in, when in, you know, you, they won't take points out for extra comments, right? But they might. But I still don't know how one grades comments. Okay, if I don't quite know how and you don't know how, I mean, we're just hoping, you know, that we get the right TA, right? To look at your code, look at the comments. So my analogy is, you know, speed skating versus figure skating. You know who won speed skating. Nobody knows what the Russian judge will do and what the American judge will do in, in figure skating. I mean, they kind of know there's all these criteria and you still quite don't you still don't quite know whether they were met, whether the triple loop was done gracefully or not. You know, you never know. So that is, the, that is another cause for concern. Okay? That well is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. Hopefully we'll reduce that completely in this, we'll eliminate that completely in this course. Even if it isn't, there's just so many more factors to look at. Okay? That you can't just be satisfied with getting the right answer. So, and, and, and you know, if you're, if you're trying to do an algorithm and you go to Stack Overflow and they will give you the correct, they will give you something that works. They won't give you something elegant. So things become more hard. Even for those guys, they're not giving something elegant. So elegant and, and, and stuff, you know, is, so this, 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 is, this can cause problems. Okay. Okay, so what are we aiming for? Now, so we are looking at style. Now, I seem to indicate that, oh, in 1.10 or CS1, you haven't done style. Can you, can you think of something you've learned in that, in 110, in this, this set of topics that is time? 
Uh, yeah. So you naming your variables? Naming your variables. Okay, no i, j, and k, maybe for loops, okay? But uh, literally, people name variables sometimes a, b, c, and that's not good, okay? Yeah? Camel case, naming your variables, have, have good names and use the right case also? Proper indentation. Proper indentation, okay? Um, that's important, right? Is it? Anybody think that's not important? I won't check for proper indentation. Maybe because you've learned it. But why else? Yeah. Not every language requires it. Okay, Python requires it. But but just because it doesn't require it doesn't mean that, you know, I mean your code should be indented to be readable. If it's not indented, it's you know, it's it's a problem. So why am I so blase about indentation? Because the computer doesn't care. The computer doesn't care, that's one way, but the human cares. So that's mat matters, yeah. It's subjective. It's subjective, but there are some rules. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. The computer can do it for you. If there's really some rules, go tell the stupid computer to do it. That's the kind of thing that computers are very good at. Okay? Control Shift F in Eclipse. It'll do it for you. Okay? So I'm not going to go and waste time having TAs look at your indentation. Maybe you know you should get some points off on not doing Control Shift F. You know, but, uh, but I think that's a command, okay? My fingers know it better than my, my mind does. So, so we won't look at, but that's a big deal. Huh? I, I, see when I see a lot of automatic checkers that focus on indentation, okay? But I won't, okay? Uh, anything else here that is, has to do with style? Something that's hard to master? I mean, indentation is kind of stupid, right? So what's... Sorry? Naming the variables. So you, a lot of you have said naming variables, <coughs> naming the classes, naming all identifiers. Yeah. Okay. So whether the variable, there's something called scope. That how, uh, what other parts of your program can look at the variable? How big the scope is? Okay. That's part of style. Excellent. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So when we learn object-oriented programming, there, there's, there's something called classes and there's something called inheritance. And how to divide your program into classes and how to relate the classes is, 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 is something that, that, that will be taught here. But that's not what I in my list here. What is in my list here that's similar to the idea that you just said? It has to do with grouping code. In this, sorry? Modularity. And what, in, what here is modularity in this list? Uh, in this case, uh, functions, basically. functions and methods. You don't have to have functions and methods. You can write one long main. Okay? And people do it, by the way. Huh? I mean, when I talk to Google engineers, they say, oh, you know, I said, you know, my students write methods that are like 10, 20 lines. Our engineers write 200 line methods. Okay? So, that is the kind of stuff that is, so you have to learn methods. That's not easy concept. So, so it's in that spirit that we will go further. And it's in that spirit we'll go to classes and inheritance and other concepts in object oriented program. Okay? So comment, nobody mentioned comments, but comments is also style. Okay, or at least it describes the style. Okay? So style is not just comments. Okay, it's naming variables, it's, it's, it's all the other things you guys mentioned. And again, comments is something I'm not going to bother too much about. I don't know how to grade comments. When you write comments, who do you write comments for, by the way? Somebody's going to read your program, right? Who reads your programs? <laughs> the programs you write in assignments. I read them. You read them. Good. Excellent. You want to write code for yourself. If, you know, especially, you know, if, if you're going to write code today and look at it 10 weeks later and it was confusing, write a comment down. Who else reads them? Who, who else should read them? I don't know if they read them or not. The TAs. The TAs. So, you, so you have to write comments for yourself and for the TAs. Don't repeat what's in the assignment. The TAs know what the assignment is. Repeat something, say something that's peculiar to what you've done. And that's not obvious from the code. Obvious to the TA. Okay? 
So now what's obvious, what's not obvious is, is you know, is not obvious, okay? So, um, but we will aim for programs that don't require any comments. When you go and break up your code into multiple methods, and each method has a good name, I've just given you the whole algorithm in a very self-documenting way. When I write a 200 line piece of code with 10 while loops, and I don't know what each while loop is doing, I've got to put a comment before each while loop saying, this while loop does input, this while output, while loop does output, this while loop does scanning. If I have a method called input value, output value, scan value, I know that, that while, the while loop inside each of these methods, what it does, okay? So we will be aiming for self-documenting programs, and this is the kind of stuff that I can write a program to check actually, okay? So there will be a very objective criteria. There will be a long list of criteria, okay? Each, we have a rubric for each assignment that is very long. You have to meet each, each, each factor to, to get full points. That's what you get, that's figure skating. Okay, there's a lot of considerations. Okay, so that's what makes this course different. And we will aim for programs that are self-documenting and reusable, as was mentioned. And that means we'll write, have modularity, and modularity can be gotten in many different ways, through procedures, through classes, um, inheritance, and so forth. Okay, questions so far? So what exactly are the topics? Okay, what I've done is I've kind of layered them. So I should have said instance methods and variables. So, you know, many of you know what that means, but if you don't, that's the foundation of everything else. Everything we learn. That's the foundation of object-oriented programming. Okay? In Java, there's something called static methods and variables. That concept exists in every language, whether it's JavaScript, whether it is basic, whether it's C, that concept exists. Okay? What may not exist in every language is the notion of instance methods and variables, which together form what is called objects that are instantiated from classes, okay? How many of you heard of beans? One person, okay? That has to do with structuring your class. Now we're getting into style issues, okay? This causes a lot of confusion. It has to do with not just, you know, you guys talked about naming, that you have to go and name where identifiers, whether it's classes or, 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 or variables properly. Here you relate names together and you, and you sort of relate the signature, the headers of method. It puts constraints on what kind of headers you put, what names you use for your method, what arguments you give, and it's easy to make a mistake there. Okay? And, and uh, the second assignment is going to talk about beans. And a lot of students get the second assignment working, but they don't get the bean concept. And it's a trivial concept almost as trivial as comments, but you have to learn it. Okay, so this is again one of the pitfalls that I'm identifying right now. Okay, so be careful. Um, it's got some strict naming, naming guidelines. Interfaces, again, some of you, I know Chris in 110 has started doing interfaces, but we'll do interfaces in great depth. Okay, and um, that doesn't cause so many problems, except that um, there are some rules on how to use interfaces, and people tend to not use interfaces um, as, um, um, as much as I, I want them to. So that causes some problems in assignments too, okay. and in exams too, okay? And we'll see why I want to, them to be used extensively. We'll defend that. Then object composition. Okay, so you can imagine that the world is structured, right? I mean, I've got arms, legs, and so forth, and a lot of, lot of the word object comes from the motivation that we want to model real world things in the computer, okay? So we have parts. And what we simulate in computer has parts. So that, that, that's objects. And now we're getting, we're getting complex. Okay, that maybe this is compl the complexity that you will learn here. Okay, that you will learn that how to create, put parts into objects. And, and when you do your assignments, this is, this is an assignment that will take time to do. Okay, you've got to get the parts right. You've got to get the whole, the whole thing right. So watch out for this. Okay. Um, we've heard inheritance. Okay, inheritance can be done with it without interfaces. And inheritance is something, you know, if you've done biology, you know inheritance. And the inheritance in computer languages is inspired by the inheritance in biology. So to that extent, it's not hard. But to harness inheritance, to understand what are the rules are, um, there's, you know, typing, how, how, when can you assign some value to a variable, given that these two, uh, the classes of the two variables are different, uh, but related. So that's very tricky. We'll spend a lot of time on this. Okay. Um, model view controller. Anybody heard of model view controller? 
three, two of you have. I told you about Android and iPhone, and all of these systems require you to know model view controller framework to program applications. Okay? So model view controller is again kind of composition. It's more collaboration rather than composition. So I am a sum of my parts or more than sum of my parts. And, and that's inherent to me. I can't be defined with my parts, but the two of us have a relationship. I'm the professor here, you're the teacher here, you're the student here, at somewhere else, you might be the teacher, I might be the student. So we have a relationship there and I can't exist without you. So that's the kind of cooperation we'll see. It's loosely coupled and, and model view controller is a very good example of the kind of power you get from object-oriented programming, okay? And the toolkits are, are these frameworks that, that use this, and toolkits, there are Android toolkits and iPhone toolkits. They all use the concept of model view controller, but with a different syntax. So we'll actually learn, you know, see the examples of some of these concepts in UI toolkits. And now we're getting messy. We're getting big. Okay, our programs are going to get very large at this point. And when the program is working at this point, you should be very proud because lots of stuff is going right. Okay. And so that's going to cause hardness. Okay. Uh, generics, we learn to some degree. Okay. Um, assertions and exceptions, we'll also learn. And those of you who are LAs and sitting, sitting in this class right now, you're saying, is that it? We learned more. And that is it in terms of required, required part, okay? Uh, this is less than two thirds of what I've taught in earlier semesters. And uh, you know, this is being sensitive to the remark that this is a very difficult course. And this is something we really, really want people to know, okay? And like I said, you know, I'm always uncomfortable when students are herded into a class and this is a required class, you better take it. Because, you know, even if you should take the course, you don't quite know why you should take the course. So this is what I'll require. And I'll make the other one third option. Okay, so if you do that, you really want to do it. So you'll feel more ownership, you'll feel more motivation. And I think a lot of you will do it. Okay, so I'm going to make the rest optional extra credit and we'll just time things in such a way that people who are in both tracks can, can go in either track and you should aim for the more ambitious track. And, but doing two thirds of what I've done in the past will let me do things in more depth. Okay? So even though you might have seen each of these concepts in some degree before, okay, you haven't seen it in the kind of degree that, that we will study here, both theoretically and it will require you to spend time understanding, okay? And in practice, okay? So, uh, so that's the goal. Now you can see the topics are layered, okay? Assertions and exceptions I can do uh, to some degree without uh, uh, inheritance, but I require inheritance to really understand the predefined exceptions. So I've shown the relationship here, and, and, and some, of these, uh, some, some of this order is arbitrary, but some of the, uh, this ordering is fundamental because of the relationship. So the topics are layered, and so will our assignments. Okay? So assignment two will build on assignment one, will, assignment nine will build on assignment eight, and so forth. And I will have nine required assignments, and the last three will be optional. Okay? But this will all be layered. Okay? Now, what, what's going to happen is that you have two one week assignments and seven 1.5 week assignments, okay? So the first assignment is 1.5 week because it's due next Friday and I've already assigned it, okay? But it's the simplest, so don't think it's, it's that hard, but you should, if you, you, should, you should do it quickly, okay? And I put all the assignments on the web already. There may be some minor tweaks, but those of you who want to use this initial time um, uh, to do as much as possible so that you're free when other courses have demands on you, feel free to go ahead, okay? And just to give you an idea, you know, I've, I've kept telling you how hard it is, it, you know, it's, it's hard for some people at least, but there are students who've tried to uh, 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 um, uh, sign out of this course, not take the course and meet the requirements, and they've done it in two weeks in the winter. I tell them, okay, you know, they say, okay, I've got two weeks in the winter, can I just do your assignments and get course credit? And I said, sure, and without you ever asking me a question, they finish all the assignments. But two intense weeks. So if you have, so this is, this is doable, so don't get too scared. Like I said, you have to, be, you have, to have, have, have the right degree of fear. If you're not scared enough, you know, you, 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 you're not careful. And if you're too scared, you're paralyzed. So you, don't, you want to be somewhere in between. Okay, so I've tried to put you in the middle here through what I'm saying. Okay? 
So each assignment will be, have its own due date. It's not that we'll say, okay, end of the semester, give us these nine assignments and get it working. We'll have due dates and, and uh, they'll be layered. And these are not just, you know, they together form something what I think is at least interesting, what students have thought is interesting. Um, if you're a Monty Python f uh, fan, you might have seen the Holy Grail and there's a bridge scene there. So you'll simulate the bridge scene and there's a lot of creativity involved. No two students created the same figures, the same semantics. There were just general constraints that we satisfy, they had to satisfy, but everybody had ownership of their own project. Okay? So I'm not going to change the project too much from before, and, and, and it will allow lots of creativity. Okay? So it's not just some mindless thing that, 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 that has no organizing theme. Okay? And um, I have on my web page videos of, of what, what, what I did for this. Most students do better than I do. Okay? That's how, in terms of what they draw. And, and so that's kind of the minimal thing, and I'm a lazy person. I, I wasn't learning. But, but, but uh, go look through the demo at some point to see where you, where you have to go. And, and then the assignments you'll see are leading towards it. Okay? Now, the question always is, what to do if you don't finish the assignment within a due date? And, you know, I've always thought it's better to do it than uh, not do it. But I have learned my lessons, both by teaching senior classes and junior classes. So if I say, okay, you know, uh, so I used to, it used to be that, okay, if you can't meet the, the deadline, we'll give you 50% no matter when you submit it. And that just, that just means that if you've got another class in, 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 in biology that has an assignment due with no leniency and, and mine is due, you will go to that, obviously, and say, well, I'll do it later. Well, this is hard enough that you can't do it later. So I'm going to be pretty hard-nosed about this now that if you don't finish it within the extra credit, within the, the late penalty period, you get zero points, okay? So this encourages you to go and be on time, okay? Uh, so let's talk about the fact that I've got this, this, this policy of being a little strict here, maybe a little or maybe very much. So the fact that the assignments are layered on top of each other, what are the pros? What's the advantage? Sorry? Small step at a time. You don't have to redo the same thing. You're probably learning on them. You're building on them, so you're building, learning new things. Other. And you know, yeah. So you learn how to reuse code. If if I'm telling you that this course is all about reusing code, and every every week I give you a brand new assignment, where's the reuse? Right? I cannot teach this course without layering. Yeah. You have an extra incentive to do things right. If they're not right or don't, don't meet the constraints, you'll be in trouble later. And more important, if you did something wrong in the beginning, and that's, we're getting to the cons now, you've got to change to get the previous assignment, next assignment working, you've got to redo the work earlier. So you learn, you will really learn. Okay, the cons? What I just said? Okay, anything else? Oh, you better not get messed up, right? Because you're building a foundation, your basement goes bad, you're hosed. If you're not understanding a concept very well, it can um, cause problems later. Because like, you know, if you don't understand the concept well, it'll cause problems later because the assignment is going to show that fact. Okay? So, you know, large scale programming, I better have a big project. Okay? So that's kind of required. And. You cannot finish an assignment if you do not finish previous assignments. That's kind of summary of what you guys see. So, you know, what do we do? So what if you cannot finish an assignment by a due date? Okay, should we just drop the course and forget about it? Or can we do something about it? And one obvious thing is, I told you I've got a demo. I just give you my solution. You guys like that idea? You like the idea? I can't. 
it won't work. Even if I gave it to you, it just, just, it just won't work because there's a lot of creativity. Unless you're following my thing completely, which I said you won't, you'll go much better than me. There's a lot of creativity here. If there's not creativity, it's kind of boring and, and you don't learn as much. So it's just not possible to go and substitute anybody else's code. Okay? That's why if your code looks like a lot like somebody else's code, there's something fishy going on. Okay? So we give you a solution. Creativity does not allow substitution. Understanding other person's code is diff difficult. and It just won't fit in. To, to make it fit in, it's not just, it's just something very clean and well-defined. It's just too many variables. Okay? So what can you do? Well, firstly, this is, this is not going to happen. Okay? It doesn't, you know, you, you will finish. You won't, it's not as if you won't understand the concept and not finish it. We have, you have enough help. You have enough time. It just, it's, it's just a theoretical possibility to some degree. Okay? But if it does happen, okay, you can shift the assignment dates. You can say, look, look the concepts are layered. Okay? So if you don't understand classes, you can't understand inheritance. If you don't understand inheritance, you can't understand model view controller toolkits. You just can't. Okay? So you have to get the basis right before you go further. So spend some more time on the basis. Just don't go further. Okay? So what you can say is that, look, I got, you know, I, um, let's assume there are only four assignments. Okay? And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't finish assignment two in time. So what I will do is, I will say at this point, I will not do assignment four. And I will move the dates to the next assignment so that when assignment four is due, I'll give assignment three. Okay? So that's what's happening here. You can, you can sacrifice some number of assignments at the end so that you can move, move that many, uh, your previous assignments that many times. Okay? So if you go ahead, if you, um, uh, you can move your assignment one due date to the assignment two due date and so forth, but sacrifice assignment four. Okay? If you get behind on assignment one. If you get another week behind, you can do the following. Okay? So you will, you will learn something. Whatever you learn will be proper, and you just won't be able to finish at some things at the end. Okay? And, and to pass the course, you don't have to really finish all the assignments. We'll have some, uh, some uh, flexibility built in. Okay? You will learn a lot if you just do eight assignments, for instance. Okay? But like I said, now that I have a reduced number of assignments, this is, this, is, this, is a, this, is, this is a moot point, I think. When I had 12 assignments, this was more important. Now that I have nine assignments, I think it's, it's not as important. Okay? Questions? Okay. So that's what I just said. So every assignment is going to have four dates. A completion date, a first Late date, 10% penalty. A second late date, 25% penalty. After that, zero, you, know, you get zero credit unless you shift the assignment. And also to encourage you to do things early and to keep you on schedule to do all 12 assignments and early submission. And there's about 30% of the class that does things by early, <coughs> usually. Okay? And the idea there is, so, so you get 5% extra credit there. Um, and, and, and so, um, and, and when I say a date, you know, I mean 11.55 p.m. of that date. Okay? So questions about that? Yes? Now, let's talk about the early submission. So why early submission? Well, you know, you may think you have a nice algorithm, and you start coding it, and, and, and you know, you got absent-minded, and you, you made a mistake that take, took a long time. And if you're doing this at 11 p.m., you're scared, you're, you're, you're nervous, and, 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 and so you'll, do, you'll make, make even more mistakes. So if you aim for extra early credit and you miss it, you know it's, you're going to just lose 5%. So you're going to be, you know, you might slip there, and, and it's not going to be as dire, the slippage. So you'll be more, you know, you'll, you'll be more productive, I think. Okay? So if you shoot for early, you should finish by completion date. So shoot for early, and, and at least you're not late. Um, now, the difference between early submission and completion date is only two days for the first assignment. For the last assignment, it will be like one and a half weeks. Okay? The early submission date is helping you target all 12 assignments. 
So if you want to do all 12 assignments, shoot for the early submission date, and each assignment has got a date that will allow that to happen. Okay? But like I said, you know, there's, there's a safety net here. Can't finish it, that's fine, you've got a completion. You can, you can, uh, you can finish with a completion date. You, you, uh, um, you know, you don't want to do all the, you can't do all the three extra credit assignments, that's fine. You're still doing, getting 100% on the assignments with nine assignments. So there's, there's a lot of safety net built in here. Okay. Questions? Not only are there going to be three extra credit assignments, but every assignment is going to have extra credit. Now, let me tell you that from an instructor's point of view, extra credit is a pain because you know you, you have to do more work. You have to go and check for more things. You're going far beyond what the course requires. But the reason is that there's just, you know, there's people talking about inheritance here and there are students who've never seen classes, okay? There's gonna be a difference. There's a difference in students. And, and so this is, this is meant to account for that, okay? And it's also insurance. I mean, you know, we know how, what happens in exams. It's a one hour period, you slip up and a lot of your points go. This is insurance saying, okay, you know, I got extra credit. I can, I, I know a lot of students, right after the midterm, they go and do the extra credit of the, of, of the previous assignment, all the extra credit, and they keep doing extra credit after that. Okay? They, so, um, also, when I said there are three um, extra credit assignments, that's a lot. That's so much that you can pretty much get your A grade before you even take the final exam. Okay, now you have to take the final exam that's required. You have to show up. But you can at least make sure that you don't have to study for it. And that's when you need the time. That's when your mathematics and biology courses are going to require a lot of work from you. So, so, so that's another reason why, why, why we have extra credit. Okay? Now, you might have a choice. You know, should you do the extra credit of an assignment or should you give it, give it early? And I recommend giving it early. That's much more efficient. With less work, you get more points. For being organized, you get benefit. Yeah, but if you're going to be late, do the extra credit anyway, if you want. That's my recommendation. Okay? But there will be times when the extra credit is so much that you'll say, you know what, help with 5% points. I want to do all that stuff. And I've got time. I don't have a biology assignment here. I don't have a chemistry assignment here. So I can do it. Okay? So it's up to you. Questions? Okay. So every assignment is going to have a list of constraints. And the constraints are not just telling, not style constraints, they're also telling you what to not use. So I'm going to make you use a very restricted part of Java. The first assignment, for instance, involves scanning. There are Java libraries that will do that assignment in one line or two lines. You're not, required, you're not allowed to use them, okay? So our constraints will make sure that you don't use certain features of Java libraries and also that you use certain things that have been taught. So be careful about the constraints. I'll have tools that go and automatically check for constraints. But this is something you have to be aware of if you haven't been forced to use constraints in the previous courses. Okay? Questions? Now, there's an issue about, you know, <coughs> if you talk about algorithm versus code. And um, how much help can you get from the TAs, from me, from the LAs, from each other when you're coding your assignment? And the general rule of thumb in computer science is at the algorithm level, at the level of natural language, any amount of help. The more help you get, especially from your fellow students, the more you will learn. Because when you give help to your fellow student, you learn, and of course that student also learns. So that's the kind of ideal <coughs> okay? And you may not be in the, in, the, in the right group to get the right help. So I've always wondered about this. So what, in case you didn't, couldn't figure out the algorithm yourself, in case you couldn't get help from the TA, LA, uh, or student in time, for every assignment, I will have in small print implementation hints, pretty much giving you the algorithm. And I know you will still learn by coding that stuff into code. So look at that small font stuff only when you're in trouble. Try to, try to think of the stuff on your own, because that's what will help you better prepare for exams and better learn. But if you're stuck, you will also find the section of implementation hints. Okay? So this is giving you a very good idea of sort of what, giving you some idea of the assignment structure. Okay? You're going to have certain dates. In each assignment, you'll also have the resources that you need to understand the material. You'll have the requirements of correctness. You'll have the constraints. You'll have some implementation hints. So you'll see all of this in the first assignment, and you'll get a 
concrete idea of what's going on. Okay. Okay, I have five minutes left. Um, and what I've done is told you a little bit about the assignments and how they may be different from what you've done before. And let's just introduce a topic and we'll finish it next time. But the question is, how do you learn the concepts? How are we going to learn the con concepts? Okay, so we've seen how we will test what we've learned through assignments. And now the question is, how will we actually make sure that you learn the concepts? And the obvious thing is that I do what I'm doing here. I show you PowerPoint slides. And, and that's sort of a regular class. And there's also flip classes. Anybody been in a flip class? Okay, a lot of you have been. Uh, was that a programming class? One person programming. So, um, what, did, what did you guys think of flip classes? Anybody? Pros and cons. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. For math class, it didn't work, and for chemistry class, it worked. You know, I relate to that so much. I could never keep up with the theorem being proved in class. And, and it was always at home that I really understood it properly. Whereas something that has got more observational stuff, experimentation, it works better. Um, what about, anybody else have comments? Does it work better for some students? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, the, so I think it works more for rock solid foundation rather than like conceptual application. So you're saying conceptual stuff, just like theorem proving, is difficult in a flip class, but application, mm -hmm. hands on. Flip class tends to be hands on, and that means application. Any other comment? Any other feelings? Yeah. So, so, you're, so at least there's also a learning style that you like to learn things on your own and when you have an issue, just go in and, and, and just go and ask questions. And we have two more minutes. Anybody, I, I won't go beyond the slide. Anybody else have feelings? Yeah. So we have this revolution in resources available. And, and just to let you know, you know, this university is making a very big, you know, that's, that's one of the big missions of the university, to do more active learning. Active learning means that more time is spent of you thinking. So when you answer my questions, you're also doing active learning. And flip class is sort of active learning on steroids. You know, it's completely that. So there are pros and cons. And what we will do in this course is tread a fine line between different kinds of teaching and try to hopefully build a good balance, okay? So we'll talk about that next time. But in the meantime, please, especially those of you who have not done Eclipse in Java, go, go and do the required stuff and um, go to the web page and, and get the resources, okay? Okay, see you in Thursday. So we were trying to figure out what we should do, how, 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 how this class should go. Should it be regular or flipped? And um, I asked you guys what your experience was. And, and the current rage is flipped classes. Okay, There's, that's it's top down. We are hearing this from everybody. So everybody is trying to re-examine and say, how can we make a class flipped? And many are saying, oh, we can't. And, and, and I'm kind of in between. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out in my own head what should happen, and, and that's why I'm, you know, I need input from you guys too. Um, but we heard last time that uh, the math class uh, maybe didn't work as well flipped, maybe because it was so concept heavy. 
uh, whereas the chemistry class maybe worked well, flipped. And I say maybe because it's very hard to figure out objectively what the measures are. Uh, but maybe because that's a little bit more real and concrete and more applied, and that's something you can, you can do problems in a short period that are of that nature, other than the more conceptual ones that require maybe heavy thinking outside class. But uh, before we sort of kind of figure out, you know, what we're going to do, as you can see, in both regular classes and flipped classes, external learning resources are useful. Okay, I mean, I can, I can, I can give you this, I can give this talk and hopefully you guys are understanding some fraction of it and hopefully you will retain some fraction of what you understood later. Okay, but it will be a fraction of the whole thing. So it's nice to have material outside class where you can, so that you can get 100% of the material before exam okay. So, um, so let's talk about uh, what kind of resources you might want and then I'll tell you what kind of resources you will have. So one obvious thing is I've done all this work, I'm not using the whiteboard, um, I've got this PowerPoint so that I can give you a PDF of these, of this, of the power, okay, so that you have that as a Anything else you might want? Anything that would be missing that you might want beyond the, so something you might want beyond the PDF? Sorry? A video. So PDF will not have what I said, okay? It will not have animations that I present gradually. So um, I can give you a video. Um, what about the PowerPoint itself? Would that be useful? Because so, so you prefer the PowerPoint. Actually, you know, I, I put them on and very few people use them. That's why I was curious. Uh, but if I could give you a video, uh, then PowerPoints at least will give you animations. Okay, you can put them, put, put it in, uh, uh, you know, put it in slideshow mode and you get the animation. Okay, so that's something you can get. But most students, don't want to go and download, you know, because PDF, you just click on it and you get it in your browser. Uh, PowerPoint, you've got to go and download. Uh, anything else that you might have had in different classes as, as learning material? Yeah. <coughs> okay, so you might want the code, okay? And maybe even why I did what I did. So hopefully that kind of stuff, why I did and what I did is partly in my PowerPoint also and, and, in, the, and, and in any narration, any, any description there. So hopefully I'm conveying that, but maybe as comments, you might want that too, good. Uh, a complete correction of the syntax of the Quran genius was looking at syntax separately as a page. So syntax of Java? So you might want syntax of Java. And uh, I can give that to you, but uh, you know, Google's, Google's, Google, Google's going to do a pretty good job. Okay, Java is a pretty popular language. So what I need to give you is stuff that you wouldn't get by just Google, that others haven't done. Okay? And uh, a programming environment helps you there too. It'll tell you when you go wrong. Anything else you guys have had in classes beyond PowerPoints and PDFs and code? Yeah. Uh, one of my professors uh, made videos. Right. So flip classroom videos, so that's consistent with what he's saying. <coughs> you could have videos that are like special short videos meant for the class, flip class, or it could be videos next, the recordings of my lecture. Like, yeah. Uh, list of stuff we can't use. List of stuff you can use. Hopefully my assignments will tell you that. But indeed, you know, for, 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 for the point of view of assignments. And also, um, um, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, you have a separate appendix, just the things you can use. Each assignment has that information. Uh, so, and in different assignments, you can use different things. It's a little tricky, but think about it. That helps me with that. Maybe we can create students. Yeah. Office hours calendar. <coughs> oh yeah, yeah. A calendar for when people are going to have office hours. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because right now I need your advisors to how to get face to face help. Okay, 
So to provide a standard solution. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know that's that's a good idea, um, except that I have to really comment it out crazily, saying this part was important, this part wasn't important, and more important, you know, coming up with projects. I used to do that every summer. I would spend time creating a new project. So at one time we did a Halloween simulation. At one time we did a spreadsheet, and then uh, I did Monty Python this way and that way. So the moment I start releasing electronic code like that, the chance of somebody using it next semester increases. So that's 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 a real problem, and that's why I won't even be releasing exam results, the correct answer. I will talk about them in class, you can internalize them, but I just don't want electronic things drifting around. They get easily passed and they, they put in fraternities and it's still a temptation. Okay? But as long as they do a good job of grading and tell you exactly where you went wrong, maybe that itself the purpose. But in terms of other language, anybody can give you class notes, written type written text, in class, as in alternative textbooks, in which class was that? Biology. Biology. So that's another alternative. Okay. So we have all these alternatives, and let's see what what you'll actually get. So I told you this course is unusual. You know, maybe NCC does a pretty good job of doing the same thing, but we are, you know, we are going to do a very intense project. Uh, at least large project, I won't say intense. So there's really no textbook. Um, one of the students mentioned KMP, he's the other instructor who teaches this, and neither of us uses a textbook. And this course has been taught before I came to this university, and it never has had a textbook. Okay? And the course has evolved. So it used to be taught in a language called Turing, and I made it Java, and, and um, so it's, it's, there's no really standard way here. So you will have the PDF of slides. Anybody who's gone to my web page will see that there's a PDF. And, and this is the most popular way that people use um, of, of, of learning, because just because you can just click on it and see it. And one advantage of PDF, this is a disadvantage also, is that since it doesn't have all the information, you fill in the gaps yourself. And the more gaps you fill, the more you learn, the more active learning you're doing, right? So sometimes a bad teacher is a good teacher because they're forcing you to think more. Somebody who tells a very logical, great story, yeah, 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 you keep going and, and you don't maybe, you know, it's like a mystery story. They try to confuse you a lot, okay? They give you the wrong clues, but you're co constantly solving the problem and ultimately you, you kind of remember the plot rather than, you know, just tell you the butler did it right at the beginning. So, uh, so sometimes that's good, okay? Uh, but you will also have PowerPoint of slides, okay? So you can, at least one person I hope will use it because I, I, I keep putting this link in. And, um, and if you notice at the, at the, at the uh, bottom right, there's, there's this icon. And anybody know what this might mean? Yeah. I added my voice to the Okay, if you notice here on the top left, it says, it tells, it tells you I'm recording. So everything I'm saying is being recorded. So I don't need a special video <laughs> camera to do the recording. The recording won't get us, but it'll get at least my voice. And if you guys speak loud enough, uh, yours too. Okay? Or if I repeat the question. So, what you can, how can you use this? Uh, you can go into slideshow mode, and it'll just be a animated with recording video. Okay? So it's you don't have to go to YouTube. You can just go and start slideshow. And, and, and you can resume it, uh, you, can, you can stop it at any time, get out of the mode, and start it at any time, and it'll just play everything with the animation and voice synchronized, okay? So this is something Microsoft has, and I've actually spent some time there, and, and even in the office group, many of them don't know what the potential here is. So it's, 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 a very unex it's not well exploited by, by, by even the inventors of, of, of this tool, and certainly not in education, okay? So I always try to tell my uh, fellow teachers to use this facility, but uh, most people don't tend to do it. And the thing is that, you know, if you notice, I like to come here, but I very quickly when I'm speaking come back here because I want it recorded. So you can't just wander around in class, and that's, that's, that's a disadvantage. Okay? 
Now, if they can go and play it like this, they can probably create a YouTube video out of it too. So the problem with this is that you've got to download the PowerPoint, play it, and so it's, it's you know, it's multi-clicks. Uh, so by the way, you can get out, get out into unsynchronized or no audio mode. And, and by the way, if you want to listen to this on, uh, on your smartphone, I have an Android, and there's, there's a tool called WPS. Um, and that one will play the recordings. Not, not all PowerPoints will play the recordings, but that's one way. So what you can also do is, uh, and this is what you know, my students who have been using this uh, in previous semesters said, hi, I wish you told us this before, uh, this earlier. Even when you're not in PowerPoint mode, you can just click on this and listen to the, listen to the voice. It won't be synchronized with the animation, but, it, but the advantage here is, that you can go and fast forward and you can go, you can, you can go to randomly access any point of the recording. You don't have to go through the whole recording of a slide. Okay? So that's another capability you have um, if you go into that mode. Okay? Questions so far? So, you know, if, if, if Microsoft can go and do this um, with PowerPoints, it can probably create some, uh, a, a video file that can be uploaded into YouTube and it does do that. Okay? So, um, and now you can go and randomly access any part of the video without having to escape in and out. And you can play at 2x because audio at 1x is rather slow. Okay. Um, and a and, uh, lot of people use this. Okay. Um, now, we have a little trade off. With PowerPoint, I can go to any slide and go and understand what happened in that slide. Okay. It is structured by slide. And here, you can fast forward, you can go forward and back in, in, in time, but you can't go to a particular slide. You can't, don't have a table of contents of slides and go to a particular slide and listen to it. Okay, so it's not a structured video. It's, it's unstructured video. It doesn't know, the video doesn't know it came from PowerPoint. Okay? So if PowerPoint can create this, if Microsoft can create this, it can probably create something that allows both. Okay? And it did. Okay? And that's called Office Mix. Okay. And if you notice that this is also something that you can play, uh, it's got a button that says play. And you, you see these markers at the bottom? These are the slides. Slide one, slide two, slide three, slide, slide four. And you can go to any of these markers to go to the appropriate slide. And you can also go to table of contents and get all the slides there and just go to a particular slide and listen to the video. Okay. So you will see that for each topic, I have Office Mix, I have YouTube, I have PowerPoint, I have PDF, I have all of these facilities. Okay, questions so far? Now, for some reason, students don't tend to use this. Okay, and I don't want to press too hard because, like I said, I spent some time in Microsoft and actually had a little hand in this. So um, you know, maybe I'm too biased, but I think this is great. But people tend to use YouTube. Okay, that's just because maybe it's more familiar. Okay, now this is not the kind of videos that, that were uh, uh, um, created for flip classes, you know, where you just speak to the camera in a very short 15 minute. So it's, it's, you know, if you think of a concert, it's not a recorded concert, it's a live concert that's been recorded, not a studio recording. Okay? And uh, I've actually tried to create such videos and there was a time when I was, you know, I, I, I was very nervous about going in front of people and I was better off without people. But now, I can't just talk to the computer. You know? So it's much easier for me to give a lecture here and get it recorded. Um, I'm more natural that way. So, uh, but, so this, is, this is not specially meant for a flip class. This is just the whole you know, video that is recorded. So you will get all the questions there, which I think is good because that makes you think. And uh, there may be long pauses while people are thinking of the answer. So again, you should think of the answer that time. And you typically cannot hear the student answer. I try to repeat the answer in some way or the other, but maybe I don't. But you, you can fill in the gaps. I listen to these videos and I, uh, a year later, and, I, um, uh, um, and a lot of students have used this, so it, it does work. Okay? But audio is not the fastest way to get information. That's why you go to 2x. So wouldn't it be nice if you also had, like a biology teacher, the text? And that's what I first did when I started teaching this course. I first created some documents. And they are available to you also. And then I created the PD PowerPoints. And PowerPoints, you know, are the ones I presented. So they kept evolving. 
whereas this text kind of remains static, like a textbook. You know, textbooks are always a little out of date because they're behind them. So, um, uh, so there, are, there are lots of typos there because it was not, you know, it's not really a textbook, but there are students who use this resource a lot. So I want to, you know, this, this is a useful resource if you don't want to listen to a video and, 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 and this is random access, it's, it's much more random access. You can, you can search for text. So that's yet another alternative you have. Okay. And what I also did was take this, take, take, convert the uh, do, uh, Word documents into Google Docs and, and make it available to you so you guys can read this and comment on it if you have questions and correct things. Uh, I think in the beginning one or two students used this facility last time, but, but I encourage you to use it if you have time. So that's yet another mechanism available. Okay. Now, you know, you mentioned that you'd like uh, source code. The source code is also available as HTML links. It's not, it's, and then it's commented on top of the comments later too. Uh, so if you want to just learn from the code, okay, that's, that's the best. That's even better than PDF. You look at the code, you try to understand it yourself. And if you can, you don't even need the PDF hints, and you're learning much more. Okay? So uh, people have used this also. So you can go, this is just web links, they're static links. You can't execute the code. This is just code as, as, as readable text. Plus, how many of you have, you, some of you have used Git. Uh, how many of you, okay, I think I, I did a survey. Very few of you have used Git. So Git is a way to get shared code, code that is shareable by the whole world, okay? So all the code that I have is also shareable that you can go and import into your Eclipse project. In fact, um, uh, how many of you have, have, have been able to get Java team? I asked you to do that if possible before today's class. How many of you have successfully gone and uh, imported the Git project into Eclipse? A few, oh good, good. Rest of you, how many of you have tried and had trouble? A few of you. So please use recitation time or maybe an end of class today to get, to get that sorted out. So, you, so this is something um, I, I encourage you to do. And, and so you can actually import all the code into your uh, Eclipse, experiment with it, change it, and, and, and look at the comments. And that's yet another way to understand this. Okay? Questions so far? So, you know, sometimes choice is bad because you have to, you have to, you have to think. And, and as an engineer, you're always trying to optimize. So sometimes, you know, it's good if you have just two cars to buy. You don't have to think about which car to buy. And, and so, but you have a lot of choice. And I've tried to tell you the pros and cons. And, and uh, depending on when you're looking at the material, maybe you will look at PowerPoint in the beginning, maybe look at the PDF before exams. So it's not as if you're stuck to one more. Okay. I did a survey last time and almost everything was used to some degree by some student. And like I said, for each topic, uh, I have links. So, you know, scanning the topic. I have the PowerPoint, the PDF, the YouTube, the mix, the, doc, the Word, Word file. Okay. If, you find, if you read that stuff and you find mistakes, please let me know. You know and, and, and I'll correct them too. I will spend some time this semester trying to update those docx files if I get uh, the PDF of the docx, uh, the Google Docs in, in Drive. Um, I also have sometimes animations uh, that I've created, videos I've created. So scanning visualization is an animation I created for the scanning uh, part. So sometimes I have that. Then there's the assignment next to it. And on the right of it is the uh, link to the code on the web that has the, uh, the source code on the web. Okay, I told you that all the source code is linked on the web. So you have that. Okay. Questions? OK, so I've told you what resources we have. Whether we do flip class or we don't do flip class, we have these resources. Now, given that we have res these resources, the question is, which one should we go to, regular class or flip class? And um, I have some typos there I have to correct. Uh, now, if we do believe that concept heavy subject should be maybe taught in lectures and sort of more applied stuff should be done in flipped class. We don't quite know because this is applied, we are, we are talking about programming. This is not your programming 101, this is programming 102, so maybe it's got concepts that you do need to internalize and so, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we don't know, quite know what to do here. It's in, it's in between. But it's hard to argue that with resources, 
uh, a live lecture is less useful than without resources. Okay? If I didn't have all these resources, I'd better have a live lecture. Okay? So with resources, the value is a little less. I don't know how much less it is. But certainly, that, that's an argument saying that maybe we should do some, something that's flipped. Okay? So if we do flipped classes, what do we do in flipped classes? So I'm just curious again. Math, what did you guys exactly do in, 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 in the flipped class? Uh, I know somebody was here. Somebody here said math. So I'm, yeah. yeah. Uh, so pretty much, there was a little different with the class. Sometimes we were happy. So basically, whatever was in the textbook, you know, why, why repeat that in class and do some problems in class that were learned in the textbook and, and have some interaction and also have some students um, maybe take the lead in presenting. And so why, 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 were you one of the people who thought it didn't quite work well? Yeah, I thought it was easy to get lost. Easy to get. The, the only thing is it was a really small class, so we got more like one-on-one -on -one attention. But um, really, was, first of all, it was math class a level over our heads because we were taking different things without having to take the three. So we didn't understand some of the fundamentals of it. Uh, but it was hard to sort of make sense of some of that. Some of the more important topics that kind of were brushed over the bottom. Um, but in the end, it worked out. We didn't have an exam. We probably all went to the so. Oh, you didn't have an exam? No. It was an undergrad class? Uh, this was actually in high school. High school, yeah. You know, we are required to have a final exam. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, we, we just, he, he was like, you're going to be taking college, so don't worry about having an exam. Okay. And the chemistry class, some of you talked about the chemistry class. What, what did you guys do? Yeah. Um, I did press the chemistry, but like, we basically, like, we, she recorded lectures, we watched them at home, now let's get the basis. And then if we had questions, we were doing the class, the really class time was like to do like kind of applied projects. And so then you could like have help there while you're doing projects rather than being like back at home or whatever and having to look through those resources. You could have more help as you came across those problems. Because in a lecture, I love that sentence. You don't know what you know until you start applying. You know, it's, it's, it's lectures. I mean, lectures are very easy for me. I've been doing that for years, and and uh, it takes time, by the way, each time you teach the course. But you know, you kind of think, oh yeah, they got it. You, the students think they got it, and then the real truth comes out in projects or in exams. So, uh, so, so that's why people are going to us for classes. So what do we do in flipped classes? Problems related to homework, or maybe the homework itself. Okay, and I asked students last time, and and they said, and, and this is good when you can when when maybe this is not phrased not phrased right, but when a small amount of work can convey a lot of concepts. Okay, because you can only do a small amount of work, and you're trying to get some concepts. But we are talking here of taking small amount of things that may or may not be hard, but putting them all together. So we're talking about creating a big project. So if you're creating a big project, you better have classes that build on other classes before that. And then you know you have all these dependencies. We already have the dependency in assignments. We have that dependency here too. And uh, another problem with this is that already the programming effort here is high. Okay? Like I said, you know, somebody told us that this class is the fourth hardest class in, in, in university. So if I add even more work to your plate, uh, you have only so many cycles. Okay? So, um, so and, and, and we have recitations where we're going to do a little bit of this stuff. So maybe we shouldn't do that in lectures also. Okay? So what can we do? 
as was mentioned, we can just do the homework here. Okay, and I really, really wanted students to do this, and I still want you guys to do that. But when I talked to students, they said, you know, you have to think hard. And I can't think with all this noise around me. I need to have my solo time to think. Okay? And, and, and yeah. When we, when we say homework here, you mean like uh, taking input from, from us and like us spreading on the group or like all of us working together telling you or asking you how we can write the program out? I'm talking about you actually doing your solution right here. So there was a solution right here. And as the problems arise, you ask. Or you could, in groups, talk about how you attack the problem. Each one of you has to submit your own solution. You can't have code duplication. That's your problem. So you can talk as much as you want to uh, before that. But, but we can't have one solution for 10 students, or even two students. So discuss how to approach the problem. When you have problems, raise your hand. Or you, so that's what I'm talking about. Any help to them? Other questions? Okay, so with homeworks, you know, should deep thinking be done solo? Maybe. And limited discussion with classmates. You know, I'm glad you want to talk to classmates, but most students, they just, you know, they all want to work independently, as it turns out, at least in computer science. So I, I keep encouraging people to work together. <laughs> but they tend to do it. And, and you know, if you're going to take the exam, you know, you, you should do some work alone. That is the coding you have to do, okay? So, you know, we are not quite sure what we should do in flip classes. So let's try to go and see non-flip class and maybe, and, and, and see what we should do in that such a class, okay? So I can, I can go and present a PowerPoint with all the concepts, okay? Um, that's one way to teach. Anybody else had a non-flip class where you did something other than use a whiteboard or have a PowerPoint? Was there any other way you learned, pro uh, learned programming in class? So one is to, so to have a lecture with either the whiteboard or PowerPoint. Any other way to, have, uh, to present a lecture? Yeah. Uh, my previous class, you would just follow along as the professor typed up the code. You would follow along as the professor typed the code, okay? So I could open up Eclipse and start coding. Okay. And how many of you have had a class like this? So um, what do you guys think? What, you know, there's no perfect silver bullet here. So what are the pros and cons of, of these two techniques? And there's only a few of you who raised your hand. That means most of you had you know, these, these PowerPoint or Blackboard, Whiteboard lectures. So what do you think? Are, are the, yeah. So what you're saying is that you were like the person sitting in the car, you know, watching what's happening. Yes. You weren't driving. And so when you had to drive on your own, you needed a GPS or somebody else, right? Yes. Anybody else? Yeah. I think that if you record your code, anyone who needs to look at how you code can watch that, it's probably not worth the last time for you to code for us to wait for you to finish coding. So wait for me. I, I am not a touch typist. Okay, so I am the worst guy in the world to do it. But you know, I mean, even if I was a touch typist, apparently that's still a problem. But, yeah. Um, in my class, the professor, would, he had the code already made, but he would kind of just like hide it for us in like a separate file all the time, and then copy and paste it into the thing when we, if as a class, would give the input of this moment. Okay, so one way of teaching is that you know, I type and you follow along, or you, you just follow me, or you retype it. The other is, I type something and then ask you what the next step should be. And then as, as a class, you come up with the next step, and then you sort of show the, the real solution, right? And that's a little bit, it's still slow, but maybe that you'll retain that a little better. Uh, <coughs> I see as a concept is that uh, A, if you're doing live programming, the amount of creativity gets subdued a lot. 
and two, even if we are doing that, okay, as a class, there will be the next line. The class comes up with one solution instead of everyone coming up with their own unique solutions. Also, everyone does not have the same programming style or the same way of programming. <coughs> so that gets affected if we do that programming. So if the, if the problem is very constrained and there's only one next line, it makes sense. But when there's so many paths to diverge, then we just go to along one path and we sort of, so that becomes a problem. So as long as, and so we're talking of intermediate programming here, where things are going to be less constrained than in inter-programming. So that's good. That solves that problem. It maybe maybe slows down the concepts, but you really understand things well because you see all these ways. But you don't see all the ways, right? Because three or four is not the only way. They can okay. maybe fifty, sixty ways. They may be fifty, sixty ways. <laughs> but if the problem is constrained. There's probably only. Okay. Uh, yeah. I found that that style was a lot more useful when introducing a new programming technique because by not seeing the board watching pieces go together and watching what happens when you. Yeah. So PowerPoint gives you the static, you know, whereas that gives you dynamically how the person's <laughs> mind is working and, 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 and so forth. And, and did you guys learn some programming environment commands in the process? When you do dynamically create something, you've got to, you got to see, oh, you can copy and paste. Everybody knows that. But maybe you can just control shift F and format things. Uh, this is how you debug. Okay? So, you know, how many of you use a debugger? Just a few of you. Okay, now I can't program without a debugger. Okay? And it's very interesting. You would think that, you know, given how long I've been programming, I would be a much better programmer than you guys. But because I know how to use a debugger, I don't think too hard before writing code. So I see students come in and, and you know, they've got, their solution is not at all, their pro program is not working at all. And we figure out what that one problem is, and it all works. And I said, wow, with one correction, your program worked? Because they, they ran the program in their head about 10 times, because they did not use the debugger. Because I said, why should I run the program in my head? I can just do the debugger. Okay. okay, so you become a bit of a hacker uh, when you know the debugger. But you know, you can't really do big programs without a debugger. So one, so one of my big goals here is for you to use Eclipse in a very fruitful way. Okay. That's what you will be doing after, after you know, in, in, at work, if you uh, join industry, and so that's so that's something you get to see when you the professor does like programming because you get to see what commands they use. Okay, so there are trade-offs. Okay, and that's why different people use different things. So um, slides are faster paced. Okay, concept and step intensive, and you can use animation and graphics. You know, whereas with code, you just got text, text, code, text there, okay? and you know, you won't find a compiler class being taught this way. You know, like uh, Nirshad mentioned, that when there are alternatives of so many and the program is large, you're not going to have a professor write a compiler in class. You just can't. Yeah, you can write some toy programs. So again, we don't know whether we are advanced or whether uh, we are beginning. And so that becomes a little bit of a problem. And live programming is slower paced. So you, you, you know, it may be too slow, but at least you understood. Uh, if you weren't just uh, blindly uh, following what was happening, you understood to some extent, and you learn programming environment commands, and it's, it's, it's used for interclasses, but not for advanced classes. So now I've told you all the pros and cons, and now let's start to make some decisions here. Okay? What if we do the following? Rather than I code in class and you watch or you change or whatever, when I do that, I better have prepared the class. I better have a script in my head where I'm going to figure out what code you're going to be going to change, what questions I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask, no, I'm not going to ask you to fill in every blank. I'm going to ask you to fill in blanks that are interesting. Okay? So you learn more as a driver than as a passenger. So what about, uh, rather than, uh, sorry, I really mean to say that you learn more as a passenger than a driver. Okay? So what we'll do is, we'll make you more as a driver. So somebody mentioned comments in, in code. So what happens in a PowerPoint presentation? I have code in a discussion, in a PowerPoint. Okay, so I embed relevant pieces of code there, and I go and animate the discussion and say, okay, this is what this is giving. This concept is being highlighted here. This concept is being highlighted here. 
So the primary thing is the presentation and I've got code embedded in it. What if I do the opposite and embed the script or the discussion in the code? So rather than you watching me, you just follow the instruction, the steps that I'm supposed to do. So you get to actually type in things yourself. It's going to be slow at your speed, but everything you're typing in, and so you're hopefully learning a little bit. Okay, so you're, you're, getting the ben you're getting that benefit as a driver. It's still slow, okay, and you, it may be too slow for you, but at least, at least you're the driver, not the passenger. Okay? So that's what I'm calling a praxis. And I've done this for every problem that I've got. And, and talking about multiple solutions, so there in the instructions will be, change this code this way, see what happens. Okay? Change this code in this way. What do you think is the alternative? Uh, what, what do you think is the pros and cons of doing so? So there's a whole discussion here, and you tend, you, you tend to sort of, you, you, you tend to, now we're getting into a flip class mode. Okay, we have, we've taken the idea of live programming in class and turning it into a flip class, flipped, uh, uh, flipped class, and, and it's also flipped in the sense that the discussion is in the code rather than the code in the discussion. Make sense? Questions? Okay, you'll get to know this when you see this. So, so that's basically it. This, this is a lot of work for me, okay, because it's easier to sort of just have a script and follow it rather than embed it all in code. But, but that's, 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 that's what, that's, you start with the program template and you start modifying it. So concept presentation in code rather than code in concept presentation. And we'll have us, you know, we wanna make sure that, you know, in, in, in a real class, I ask you questions, you answer them, I'll hopefully record that somewhere and we have participation. So we do wanna make sure that you thought about what you did rather than you didn't just follow. So we'll have a quiz, Sakai quiz, where you will actually give in the answers, okay? Now that quiz is at a, at, it's gonna be mostly at the conceptual level. That quiz you can answer without doing the practice. So if you don't like, if you're fine with the video, if you're fine with the text, with the, with the notes, you can just go and use those to answer the questions. You don't have to go through. This is yet another mechanism. This mechanism, is fraught with more problems because something might not work, you might change, you might not follow the instructions right. So this is where we'll provide you with help. Okay, this will require more help than, uh, because this is hands-on programming, it'll require more help than you're just watching it. Okay, but <coughs> there's, there's no requirement that you actually go through this mechanism. All we want is the quiz to be done, the questions to be solved, answered, okay? So, uh, so what we'll do, is now a hybrid mechanism. That's what I've been motivating. I will, for each topic, introduce the topic in a live lecture, okay? at a conceptual level. That's where I'll use things that you can't have in, a, in text code, you know, graphics, animation, analogies, discussion a little bit, int introduce the problem. Just, you know, what you might expect, in, but no details, okay? The details you can get either through any of the resources that you have available to you, including the practices, and after the quiz is due, we'll go and again have a live lecture to sort of understand together what we learned. Okay, the quizzes are going to be, yes, you know, things that Sakai can grade, you know, multiple choice, you might just guess C each time. Uh, and so we'll actually go and say, why was C right and why was C wrong? Okay, and, and, and any problems you have. Okay, so any problems you had understanding the material. So we're going to have that. And, and during the time, and there's going to be some time in class where you can use whatever mechanism you want to understand the material. You may just do all the quizzes at home and just ask questions about assignments. Okay? You may go and discuss with us or with students why the answers this way and not that. Okay? So you can use that time to end it as, as, you, as you like. Okay? And, uh, so, so we'll be here to ask, uh, to answer questions, and you can use it for debug. If you, if you, if you think that you know deep thinking is done solo, well, maybe debugging is something you could benefit from in class. Okay. So the class time will be uh, will be somewhat where you have uh, interaction with each other, with us, one on one, not a lecture, and you will also have uh, some live lectures, which are which, which, which is being led by the instructor. So does that please make sense? I mean, do you understand? Any questions about what we do? Okay. 
Any comments? Any, any pitfalls you see here? I'm serious here. I, 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 I don't pretend to know what's right for everybody. So, uh, but we, we'll see how it goes. When we say with what kind of, with like, you know, like, is it a much better choice that we have to write before, like uh, something like, uh, what is it, Hacker Ant or Quotia? So do we write code in quizzes or do we actually uh, do multiple choice? So actually the first quiz is available to you, okay? And you can have a look at what, what it has, but it's multiple choice, okay? So again, you're writing enough code, okay? So I'm not gonna make you write more, okay? And, automatic, and, and, and that would mean I have to write some grade or something to go in and actually check your code, and that's, that's what all of it okay? So we'll be doing that for assignments and we'll talk about that next, but uh, so far so good, okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they'll be graded. Okay, so yeah, if you don't grade something, uh, the chances of them getting down are very small. But no quiz will be more. The quizzes the overall, the weighted of each particular question will be very small. So they're very low stake. And the idea is that you take these quizzes, these low stake quizzes, so that you can do your exams at a high stake. Okay? The open book, so open open discussion, everything. So the chances of you getting less than 80, 90 percent is very small. Okay? So they only help you improve your grade, not reduce. What's the timing plan on the quiz? So um, I could have the quiz open in the start of class and, and end at the end of class. But that's, I think, you know, making, putting too much time pressure on you. So I'll give them to you. I'll give you maybe four or five days. Okay? And you can do them at leisure. But they will be due. due so, so I've already opened the quiz, uh, today's quiz, and it's due. Tuesday night. Okay, so you have so many days. But I really encourage you guys to do it in class. Okay, so uh, next Tuesday, I'm encouraging you guys to do the work required so that you can discuss. I, I don't mean it to be done alone. Okay, uh, so so next class is the one that I recommend for doing. Okay. Okay. Questions? I'm trying to make sure that the quiz due date is separate from the. Final do they? Because if they are together, then there's just more pressure on you. Okay. okay. So, class participation. I do want to make sure that you guys, A, come to class. Okay. Uh, I know a lot of you don't need to come to class. You can learn stuff without class. Okay. A lot of students in my class, A graders, have not come to class. The reason I want this is because this is the time you have devoted to this class. And when you go and say, oh, I'll look at the stuff later because there's a YouTube lecture on it. Well, that later may never come because there's a chemistry homework. A... So one of my jobs is to save you from yourself, save you from your, uh, you know, not yourself, we all work with deadlines. Okay? So I do want to make sure you come to class, but not just sit passively, but gain something from each class. So to measure that, we're going to have some great associated with, with that, with, with, with class participation, okay? So if it's a lecture style class, then I, I need you to s write down one thing you learn from that class, okay? If it's a non-lecture class where you, it's, it's, you know, you're interacting with each other, with us, I want you to indicate some progress you made. In, learn, in doing the quiz, in doing the assignment, or something that, that, that prevented you from making progress. Okay? And I want you guys to sort of note that and write it down. And I don't know exactly how we'll share it with, with the instructors. The easiest thing is handwritten, but maybe we'll have a Google Docs or a, even a Sakai submission where you can just submit electronically. But I think, I think just giving a handwritten note may be easier for everybody involved. I'll talk to the LAs also. And each of you, uh, so, so these notes can form like a diary of what really happened during the course, okay? and it'll give you a good idea. Okay, so, is, is, any, any confusion here? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm going to ask you guys to do it maybe. Okay, recitation will have its own quiz. So let's just write out your lectures first. I've never done this before. Okay? I've had people self-report 
what so what I did last time was they self-reported uh, what questions they asked. And please, you know, when you answer questions, do do make a note of what you did because you know the reason why that's important is that every time you answer a question is is equivalent in my mind to you answering an exam question. I gave you a question, you answered it, you learned something, I learned something about how much you learned. So it's like, so I, I, I believe a lot in class participation. And so, uh, so that's the reason why you should work that. Other uh, things? So we'll do it, we we'll let it stay class. Okay. So not, not today, but please, those of you who have been interacting, just note that. I need to, we need to get organized, we need to make sure the class stabilizes. Okay, we, we do lose a lot of students after, you know, uh, in the first one week because they may be not Okay, so we, we, I'll tell you the next. But it, it won't hurt you to go and write a note down, right? you know, write down what you learned. But we haven't really talked about concepts today. Okay, so we, 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 we let things settle down. Other, there were other hands too? Any, 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 any concerns? Be feel free, I, I have a thick skin. A anything, any concerns you have about this? It seems to really like a good idea to me. Uh, I've had people self report. Forums? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a function of So, so you, can, you, can, you, can, you can submit privately to somebody what you did? Forum is, seems public to me. The yeah, outside is public. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about privately going and submitting to, to, some, to us <laughs> what you did. Yeah, so that, that could be, that may be the best way to do it. Actually, I like that. I've done that for another course. They, they submitted assignments that way. So maybe that's what we do. That will be a pilot and then, then, then I think you can search. Yes, I think. Thank you. We, we'll do that. Okay? So, forum, private. <laughs> this, is, this is why we need discussion. Yeah. So, in Piazza. So one person said, why don't we use forums in Sakai? Okay, but forums are public. So then, you know, another alternative is use forums in Piazza, which is also public, but Piazza also has a way of privately submitting uh, a, a message to the instructors. And, as, and we can search easily by name there. So I think that is the perfect solution. So that's why it's good to have discussion. Okay. Uh, other concerns and uh, questions? Okay. Uh, so again, when you're doing your quiz, uh, you can you can have. Uh, that's what this is what I saw students. I did this practice idea last semester, last year, and so on, you know if you have enough bits in your uh, on, on your screen, you can have one part be the Sakai quiz, and the second part be whatever you wanted. Okay, and most of the students had Eclipse window open on the second part, and 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 that's and and so that's one alternative. Or you could have a PowerPoint PDF open. A lot of students did that too. Some students came with headphones and had YouTube videos uh, they were listening to. Uh, and you can use Mix too. So uh, oh, there was one student. And he, he, he did very well in class. So this is, I'm not saying this is a bad method at all. And he just looked at the Word documents. And he kept pressing me to update those documents. He said, please make them up to date. And, and, and so I will. He's the one who's motivating me to do that. I will try. But you know. You see, there's a lot of work involved in this course. Okay. Okay. Just to give you an idea of, of sort of you know how effective the practices were. So all the videos are on YouTube. I can actually figure out how much viewing they're getting. And uh, you know, I have not only videos for this class but other classes I teach. So you know, I'm looking at YouTube analytics. This is a very crude method of figuring out how much is being, uh, how much uh, of the videos are on YouTube. But you know, when I first created the videos, I liked the fact that people were watching. Ah, I did something useful. And then I stopped liking. Then I saw when that was happening. That was happening before the midterm and finals. And I'm saying to myself, oh my god, you know, are they struggling for chemistry and physics also? Or are they just watching these videos? Because these videos take time to watch. If you're doing it evenly over the semester, I'm fine. If you're doing it before finals, that is scary. Okay? So that's why I said, you know, what can we do? To prevent you from doing this, and the quizzes are a record of what you learned in each class. And when you're studying for the exam, you can just look at the quiz questions, and if you understand why it was C and not B, you understood a lot. Okay? 
So I looked at the analytics with Praxis and without Praxis. So the top semester is, you know, when I had no Praxis. And you can see that in the final exam how big the peak is and the scale is different. Each, each unit is 500 uh, minutes. The middle semester is when I was teaching nothing. So there are people who watch the videos even when there's, you know, from outside the, outside the outside UNC. And if you notice, what happened last semester was that we were just about 25% more than what the, the, gen, the demand is when there's no class being taught. So the videos weren't used as much, and I was actually happy because it meant that, and the exam performance was as good, if not better. So that's why I think at least the quizzes are good. Whether the praxis are good or not for you, you can decide. Okay? But, but I, I, I do believe that, especially if they're low stake quizzes. So let's talk about stakes. Uh, what I've had in the past is the midterm was 22%, the final was 28%. Okay? Now you notice the final is 15%. Okay? So that is just counterintuitive. Right? I mean, how can a final be less than a midterm? But given this course, does it make sense to anybody to make the final less weighted? So at midterm point, you haven't learned all the material. By the final, you have learned all the material. And also, we have a Q. What is the job of a final? To be a cumulative exam? Your assignment 9 or 12, wherever you end up, is cumulative. You are learning that's all the stuff before that. OK? So I don't need a cumulative final exam. Also, when I go to the second part of the semester, it's more messy, if you will. There are a lot of objects being created. It's just large programs. I can't have large programs be written in, in, even in a three hour. Okay? So it's, it's, it's less testable by itself. Okay? So that is the reason why it's 15%. And the extra credit is going to work out as such that if you do all the extra credit you, and, and you've done well all, already, you will already probably have 100% before the final exam. Okay? So we can use 100% before the final exam. It's, it will be possible to have 100% before the finals. Okay? Now, you're still required to take the final. But you can just come, come show up, write your name, and, and go back. Okay? I don't have to grade your final. You don't have to write anything down. And, and all you can, you know, I, if you've done all the assignments, you've done all the extra credit, you can't help not know information. Okay? Even if you don't study, it's just it'll be hard to purge it out of your head. So you are welcome to take the exam, and I may or may not grade it if you already get it. And I will tell you before the final exam whether you're getting an A grade or not. So additional results can be like, uh, have last year's finals and midterms and so on? Yes, you will have last year's finals and midterms without the solutions. Okay, if I give you the solutions, you just look at the solution, you won't even bother to attack the problem. So I, you, you'll exactly have those. Okay? So the lecture quizzes will be worth 10%. There'll be about 16, at least 16 or 15 of them. So no quizzes more than 1%, so it's low stake. Okay. Um, recitation quizzes, there will also be some quizzes to make sure you did the recitation work. Uh, that's also a small uh, amount of percentage. Um, in class, I'm dividing that into two parts. One is that, hey, what did you learn? What progress did you make? 6%. I'm also interested in you guys answering questions. And, and, and I'll give you plenty of opportunity to do so. Okay? Because we will take the quiz, then I'll ask you, why was the answer this? And surely each one of you should be able to, who did we got the answer right should be able to get some solution. Right? Now, you know, speaking in a large class is, you know, kind of intimidating, uh, but there's really no bad answer. You just have to realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's no, at least I'm not judging you, and I don't think your fellow students are judging you. Okay? So I will encourage those of you I have not heard from. To, uh, to, 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 to answer, and I try to make sure that it's evenly, you know, those who answered before, I try to uh, choose people who haven't answered the questions before, okay? But that is going to be an important part, okay? So there's no final, but if you guys are answering questions in class, I'm much happier than, than grading a final. So that's an oral evaluation. Assignments are 38% without the extra credit, okay? But you'll go, you can go far further with extra credit. Okay, and then there's a fudge factor where, you know, if you're on the bottom line and, and I, you did something remarkable in terms of class participation. I, I love you. And I've done that two or three times. Okay. So questions about this? Okay. So, you know, there's a bunch of people who left class early. And I'm going to put a Piazza message telling them not to do that. Okay. 
So if you really have an excuse, please let me know beforehand. Otherwise, uh, that's just, it's, this is disturbing to me and it's probably disturbing to, to people uh, around you. Too. Um, so, like I said, I'm not going to uh, change uh, the assignments very much, if at all. Okay? I'll only change if they need to be changed, not to, not to uh, change them for the sake of changing. But just remember that since there's enough creativity in these assignments, uh, it's very easy to find out also if, 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 uh, um, if, if there is some plagiarism. So, so sh you know, don't be scared of talking to each other about anything about the assignment. Okay? Just don't copy the code. Okay? And I've taught this for many years, and I've seen only two or three occurrences of this. But I have to make a point of, of, of pointing, saying that you know, this, is, this is not allowed. Okay? Most of you know that. And, and you know, there are all kinds of incentives um, to do some plagiarism. Now, you know, I know it's midterm time. I know it's final time, and everybody's sneezing and coughing. Okay? That's, and, and including the instructors. Okay? So there is, you know, this course, unlike, unlike some other courses, a biology course, you know, when you write, or, or, or a journalism course, when you write your, submit your solution, you don't have somebody telling you you're wrong. Whereas when you submit a program, somebody's the pro the, telling you, like, hey, you didn't pass the test case. So that adds a lot of stress, and, and it can lead to distress. So in, in the handout that I present, I've submitted on, um, on, uh, on my web page, there's all kinds of links uh, to university services, but, 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 but come talk to us, okay? And um, what we'll do is, um, assuming that two or three other LAs do show up, okay, I think we have enough LAs and TAs that we can, I can divide you guys into small groups and each of you can have a sort of mentor. Okay, so what we, what we might do is, I have only three minutes left, but think about this. Di divide this space into six or seven or hump regions with each region Based on onions, that'd be the easiest. You know, we just go onion A to A to A to C, D to E, um, and have have one LA or TA in charge of you guys, and they are they are your mentor. Okay, they are the ones because you know some of you will come to office hours and ask questions. Some of you will not even do that. Okay, you'll be shy. You say, "Oh, it's my fault." It's never your fault. Okay, I mean, if you're having a problem, other people are having problems too. So don't, don't think that, you know, that's what causes stress a lot of times. Or students say, oh, I missed this particular part in assignment five, and I've done so well so far, this is the end of the world. And I have to tell them, this is not the end of the world. Okay? And, and, and so come talk to us, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, we will have somebody monitoring you too, to make sure that you don't get to a point, a breaking point. Okay? Now, I have two minutes here, and I want to ask you this question, because this is going to de decide what we do in terms of instruction resources. So in those days, when I'm not presenting in front of you, when you are doing whatever you want to and talking to us, how many of you will be willing to ask an instructor for help that you might otherwise ask in your Lord, Because I can do two things. I can have a lot of office hours and have fewer LAs here, or I can go have all the LAs here and just make sure that, and, and this is the time, why, why I like this idea is because, like one student was trying to get hold of me, and I just have meetings all day today, and I'm being in town tomorrow, and, and, but I am available during this time. So a lot of times students are not available when the LA is available. We can have others spread out a lot, but this is the time when everybody's here. So if you don't feel shy about, and we might just have one region where, you know, for assignment help, you have a little bit more privacy also because this class fits 300 students and we have about 120 right now and it might go down to 100 soon. Okay. Uh, so we have space. So um, uh, for those of, those of you who feel uncomfortable, just give me an idea. Anybody feel uncomfortable asking a question here? Uncomfortable? Or you can send me a message. So let's, let's just do that. We have the whole NAs here and we just see how what's happening. I have some office hours. And then we go and adjust the office hours uh, accordingly. Uh, right now, my office hours are on, on, on the web. Ken, you're going to put your office hours on Friday, right? Uh, yeah, once I officially have an office. Yeah, you have an office. <laughs> but but we, we, find, we find a reason. 
So, uh, okay. Excuse me. I do office hours. So we were talking of, we are still talking about the course intro here, and and uh, um, we were talking of help last time. And once we get in class activities going, that means I'm not lecturing to you. We have actually stuff going on uh, where you you're, you're on the computer either working on your assignments and getting help or doing the praxis. Um, there'll be there'll be help in uh, help provided in the class, and of course there's office hours. Okay, and uh, you know office hours has been a bit of an issue because the offices were first not assigned, and when they were assigned, the keys weren't available. But I think so. Yesterday, for instance, Jed went to the office and couldn't find the key, um, and I heard this morning that the keys are available. So I'll put them all on the web now. The, one, the hours have been posted on, on Piazza. Uh, some of them have been temporary locations. They'll get more permanent now. And also based on how in-class activities go and how much help you guys actually get, uh, and there we'll adjust the office hours. Okay? So if, if there's not much demand for help during, during class, then we'll have some LAs shift to uh, just pure office hours. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll have both, okay? Um, and, um, you know, when you're in class, you're here, we're all here, so there's no question of going to Brooks and trying to get help and trying to find the right person to get help. So try to resolve, resolve it in class if possible, okay? Or through Piazza. Piazza is, is first preference because then you articulate your question, everybody knows the answer, uh, so that's good, okay? And uh, we have, I'm there to help provide you help. We have TAs, we have lab assistants, and different people have different backgrounds. Okay. So you're going to get uh, different, uh, you know, different, you can get different answers from different people uh, just based on, the, based on the background, okay? So uh, some, have, some, some people have taken 401 with me the last time I taught it, okay? So they, they know most accurately what I'm gonna do to, uh, this time, things change, but but things change uh, um, slowly. So they are the ones who have the latest information. Some took it in earlier semester, so they are missing some information. Uh, some took it with another instructor. Okay, so I teach this course, and Kathan, also known as KMP, teaches this course also. So we teach different things, at least in different ways. Uh, and some have never taken 401. If, if you're a TA, you might have come from another place where 401 is not quite offered. Something similar is offered, but not quite 401. And um, almost none of the TAs or LAs has experience with implementing the software tools we have. Okay? So there's different background. Okay? And uh, you know, it's OK to, for, if you're an instructor, it's OK to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And it's OK for you guys to hear that. Yeah, and that's always been true, but in the days of Google today, it's even more true where knowing is less important than, you know, finding out, uh, willingness to find out, okay? So, um, also, this is more for the instructors, but if you don't know the answer, don't just say, hey, go to that person. Try to find out what the real answer is so that next time you can help, okay? So, um, okay, so it'll, it'll work out. Um, questions? So that's face-to-face -face help. There's also non-face-to-face -face help. And like I said, use Piazza for con conceptual questions. And if you ask a question there, everybody gets to see the answer. So that's the most efficient way of asking questions. I've had a bunch of mails being sent to Help 401. And we answer the question, and I always send them, tell them, hey, please use Piazza. Because if you have articulated a question, you're already ahead of the people who have the same problem but have not articulated it. So let everybody else also benefit from, your, from the answer you get. Okay, that's why Piazza is good. And not only that, as, as we've seen already, students will answer your questions. Fellow students will answer your questions. So this is just great. Okay? Uh, so f use the help alias only for grades, which are of private nature, and any, any other private problem. Okay? So there is a snippet of code you need to send. Uh, then send it. Don't, don't send code in Piazza, because 
code to be copied. Okay? And, and actually, uh, uh, try not to ask questions based on code. And uh, that's more debugging. Um, and that you can sort of come talk to us about. Uh, so whenever somebody comes to my office and says, and opens up their laptop, I said, okay, check the way, tell me what the question is conceptually in English. And by the time they ask the question, they've answered it themselves sometimes. Okay? So uh, we want to answer at a little bit more abstract level. And of course, if there's a debugging problem, we will look at the code. But try, try not to go and say, here's, you know, I often, we often get this. Everybody gets it, all the instructors. Here's a program. It's not working. Help. OK, now that's too deep. OK? So uh, you need to sort of be more specific and, and say, this is what I've tried, and this is not what, this is what not, doesn't work. OK, so don't send mail to individual instructors. And, and you guys have been very good about that so far. And, but when you send help message to help <coughs> alias, one of us will reply, OK? And we'd CC to help. So do a reply all so that everybody else gets the answer so that we're all on board. It's not that one person has the information, OK? And like I said, don't send code saying it doesn't work. Questions? OK, so that's human help. This is the world of automation. So the question is, can we get help automatically also? Okay. And is this a concept you've seen before you came to this class? Software tools helping you? Answering questions for you? Telling you where you're wrong? One person is saying no, one person is saying yes, OK? Um, so it was So if there's an error, who will tell you? The compiler. The compiler. OK, and, and if the programming environment is nice, it will provide you with uh, a little bit better message. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, and the compiler will probably be more correct than a human being may be, because they know the exact, it knows the exact rules. So uh, got the wrong one. But that's OK. Hopefully, we'll last. <laughs> So, uh, so my, my laptop doesn't have a very long battery, so we'll see. Yeah, that, we'll see how far we get today. Uh, so um, that's, that's one thing. Um, anything else you've seen in this class where they, you know, some, some automated tool has helped you? You found them helpful because? Yeah, like it was great to see everything. So, you know, sometimes people come to, come to me and say, am I on the right, right track? And that tool tells you if you're on the right track, right? So um, that's, that's, that. so those, those also. So, so um, uh, the praxis are meant to actually, so what you mentioned was the compiler and programming environment. And um, they, it's, you know, that's part of the reason why I'm using Praxis, because I want you to be able to get help from the tools. So, you know, what's the job of an instructor, a teacher? Is to help you learn topics or help you learn how to learn? Okay, so I want you to help you learn how to learn, okay? So if you start using the programming environment and you haven't really, many of you haven't really scratch the surface also of what help the programming environment can find, uh, help uh, provide. So that's, that would be good. Um, so so this, these are kind of the, 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 the praxis are meant to sort of formalize the help you can get from the programming environment. So for instance, if you want to know what operations you can do on a string, okay, you can just go and say, uh, you can just type string dot and it'll go and tell you, OK, can add, can add, code point, da, 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 all these operations available. Then you can go to a particular operation and go and read the whole documentation of it. OK, so the programming environment is providing you with information. You come and ask me what can add does, maybe I'll make a mistake. But this is going to be uh, more precise. OK, so um, in the praxis, I'll often tell you, OK, hover over this operation. Go and read the Java doc of it. Um, um, do this operation to visualize the data structure. So, um, so programming environment, and, and you, you might have seen already that if you try to make a mistake, it goes and says, sorry, you can't convert from double to end. 
and it will tell you also what, what an option is. You can add a class to it. Okay, this is the kind of help that a human being might provide that the tool provides because it has the information and is willing to share it with you. Okay? So, um, there, is, there is visualization of data structures. So often I will create PowerPoint presentations to go and visualize a data structure. And uh, the programming environment does it for me. Okay, so there's, there is an object hierarchy is available. An object can have sub-objects. And uh, um, this is being shown. You, how many of you have seen something like this where you see an object structure? Okay, so only two or three students. Okay, so the rest of you haven't seen it, but it exists in the, if you use Eclipse. So again, in the praxis, I will tell you, okay, do this, do this, do this, and this is going to allow you to visualize the data structure. Yeah. Sorry, so are praxis like homework assignments sort of? Like, I'm, not, I'm not clear, like, what are they? Praxis are a means to do your quizzes. Okay. You may not look at the praxis or may look at the praxis, okay? So they are yet another means to go and learn something. So, so your obligation is to do the assignment, do the quizzes, Sakai quizzes, and to do the data, give the data. How you do this, I'm giving you complete freedom, a lot of freedom, which sometimes is bad, okay? But praxis are exercises that, uh, and, if, and if you looked at my Piazza post, you, I've told you, please do, do, do this to access the first praxis. I assume you haven't quite done that. Once you do that, you'll get, you'll get to know exactly what they are, okay? But basically, they are a formal way to go and help you harness the capabilities of the programming environment, okay? So the programming environment has all these teaching tools in it which you don't know. And what I've got is a script that will tell you, okay, do this, do this, so that you can uh, look at this command and achieve this purpose. Okay, questions? Okay, so Praxis formula, the teaching through programming environments. And uh, just as there's object structure, there's, there's um, type structure, even those, those, that is visualized. So you can learn a lot through the programming environment. Okay, so, let me just ask a sort of philosophical question. So what do you think are the limits to such help, automatic help? Uh, you know, we are trying to automate a lot of things for good or bad. I don't know if it's good for society or bad for society, but that's the trend. Uh, there's automatic driving, of course, now, and, and, and there's automation in almost all algorithms. So what do you th if somebody was to tell you, OK, I'm going to offer you a job um, in a company that has to automate teaching, would you take the risk? What, what does your instinct tell you? That is there, is there potential of success there? Let's forget whether there's money to be made or not. Okay. Or does it tell you that this is too hard, that you know, we, we always need humans to help? Anybody have an opinion? Yeah. I'd do it. You'd do it? Yeah, for sure. But I, I think the limitation with like, a lot of the like, current programming environments is that they can only to a certain extent in what the programmer's intent is. So there's this limit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are limits. Because there are limits. They don't know what you're trying to do, only they can only check against it. So you're saying you would do it with a little caveat that you know there may be limits to how far you can go. Yeah. Yeah, and anybody want to say, anybody? So, 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 but you do think there's, there's potential, right? Why do you think there's, yeah. If, if a person wants to learn something, they will learn it in spite of the teacher's best efforts to get in their way. Thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't. I don't know if I thank you. Enough, you you spoke in my mind. And, and I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. People who want to learn will learn. You know, th there's a lot of research in teaching where they say, "Okay, I taught it this way and I taught it that way, and I got so much difference." And I don't believe those results because people who want to learn will will learn despite the teacher's best efforts to not make them. Learn. A good teacher will facilitate the process, yeah. but that doesn't. In fact, sometimes the structure gets in the way yeah. because you, you go to sleep because everything is so straightforward and linear and logical and you're not having to think and, and, and do that. So, yes, that's another way to look at it. Um, and I absolutely agree with you, okay? Um, even though I'm right here, teacher. Uh, you're doing great. <laughs> uh, because I haven't taught you anything so far. I'm just telling you what I will do. I mean, we get to look at a technical concept, okay? <laughs> Uh, also, you know, you look at the class sizes. So this class size is diminished. And, but we started off with 120 students. And the other class, KMPS class, has like, started off with 290 students. 
okay? Uh, 101, uh, Chris Jordan's class has, I think, 300 students in each class. Uh, he teaches 1,000 students. So look at how large, Berkeley has 1,000 students. Look at how large these classes are that are manned by a single instructor. The only way they can succeed is if there is, if there is some mechanical aspect to teaching. Even the part that, is, that you require a teacher for. So if there's a mechanical aspect to teaching, eventually it'll get mechanized. Okay? We just need to figure out how to do it. So, uh, so I pers I'm a big believer that tools will help, but, you know, but, but humans are also important. Humans are important for things that tools can't do very well. Uh, so they want to, you want to sort of see what, how you can help today, automate that, and then find new ways to help. Okay? So um, as was mentioned, uh, you know, we've got the local checks that they will do. So uh, those of you who've tried this out, uh, what is the difference between local checks and checks uh, and uh, UNC checks? Okay, so local, um, um, uh, you said two things. Um, the um, uh, UNC checks are sort of compile time checks, whereas local checks are runtime checks. Okay, so they execute your program. And as it turns out, at runtime, some compile time information is available. So they often uh, do the same things also. Okay. Um, and you said another thing that uh, uh, local checks is what will event decide your eventual grade. Right, and, and UNC checks maybe don't factor into the runtime grade. Actually, that's wrong, okay? So there are some things, I said some compile time information is available at runtime, so local checks will do, do those, that checking, but some are not available. So if, if I want to make sure that you haven't used a library that is banned, <coughs> runtime checks can't figure that out. They don't know whether you used it tokenized or you used the index of operation in string or you wrote your own index of operation. That, the runtime, the, the uh, UNC checks will look at. Okay, so please try to get all the errors off from both checks. Otherwise, you will, you will lose points. Okay? So together, and, and because local che the UNC checks are compile time checks, they are, they, they're like somebody sort of standing over your shoulder and telling you this is where you've gone wrong, this is where you're right. <coughs> okay, whereas runtime checks, is, they're, they're executed only when you're ready to execute the program. They're much later. Okay? So both are important, that's why we're emphasizing them, but they're not required. If you are pretty sure about your program, you write your own test cases, you go and look at all the requirements carefully, you look at the rubric and validate that everything is um, as, as desired, you don't have to use them. Okay? But these are just optional tools that are available uh, for you. So um, they basically warn against requirements not met, both of them and indicate potential sources of error. And uh, um, the uh, UNC checks, uh, you know, the, you, we've got this in much more detail later uh, in, in, in another slide deck. So this is something you run from Eclipse. They're, they're integrated within Eclipse. And they tell you things like, you know, you, you haven't declared uh, a method called process input that returns void. But this is something I can check at runtime or I can check at compile time. Okay? So, but, they, but at, at compile time is telling you, okay, this is something missing. So you say, okay, I've got to do this. So you look at that, then you, you write process input, then it says, sorry, process input should be calling um, a scan, a scan, the scanner. So you aren't calling a, a, a scan routine. You say, okay, let me add that. So it's basically there telling you what steps are required to go further. And on Friday's in Friday's recitation, hopefully Kent will take you through this through a path where we'll take some, uh, we'll, we'll gradually evolve uh, a solution towards the correct solution and see how these checks results change. Okay. Now there are two kinds of uh, the, the, uh, messages here. One is saying, look, something is missing. The other is saying, hey, I found something that I expected to find. Okay. So it says, uh, you know, I found. Um, uh, a class called assignment one um, that you're supposed to implement. So that's good. Don't, don't, don't get, you know, when you see a good message, that's an info message. Info messages are good messages. Warning and errors are bad messages. Okay? So uh, it's telling you both what you're doing right and what you haven't done. And you, you get some messages 
right in the editor pane, and some you get in the problems pane. Okay? So there's a problems pane where you get all the compiler warnings and errors. In that also are the check style messages. Okay? Again, this will be a little bit clearer when you start using this stuff or when Kent demos it on Friday. Okay? And each assignment has a checks file associated with it that checks for that assignment. Okay. So that's something that, that, that I mentioned in the check style uh, documentation also. And if you're curious, uh, you can go into the checks file and just look at them. Okay. So all the assignment specifications that I have in English are translated into a computer understood form. And you'll probably, if you look at, look at it hard enough, understand what, it, what the language is really going to say. Okay, but you don't need to, uh, but, but you know, there is a pattern with that I'm, I expect many of you will be able to find. Okay? And, anything, and some of these things, messages will have an EC after them saying it's extra credit. So it's okay if you're not doing extra credit and you get a message saying, sorry, this extra credit function not defined. Say, okay, that's okay. I, I'm not doing extra credit. Okay? So you, you'll see things like that in the checks file. Okay? Runtime local checks, this is the one that actually texts your, tests your program at runtime. It uses both information provided at compile time and the runtime checking. And like, like was, mentioned, was mentioned, that you'll find, uh, you know, you'll find this tool. Uh, and this is something to run in Eclipse. You don't have to go and go to a server to get the results. Okay? Now, here also you'll see a message saying compute angle not equal to correct angle. And you might sometimes get a null point or exception there. So, you know, writing these checks is not easy. <laughs> writing any code is not easy. Writing these checks is not easy, okay? So it's possible that there'll be mistakes, that you'll have correct code, and we'll say incorrect results. So please let us know, okay? And also, more important, when your code is not correct, it can be not correct in many, many ways. And we haven't anticipated all those ways. So sometimes we just throw out not going to accept them, saying something unexpected happened. So at that point, contact us, but also look at the console. In the console, the checks are saying, I'm trying this now, I'm trying this now, I found this right. I found. So you'll be able to see at what point the check was when it failed. Okay? So do look at the console, try to understand what's going on, try to help us before you come to us and say, hey, I don't understand why I'm getting this message. Okay? Also, um, and this is something that uh, uh, hopefully we'll have working this time, but I don't guarantee it. Uh, like, I, like I said, your eventual grade will depend on both check style and local checks working correctly. So the integrated grade, which combines both these things, are available through a grading server also. So if you have trouble installing things, uh, and if the server works reliably, uh, server is working, but it crashes often, and, and it's very hard to debug something like that. Uh, but this is something, again, that will be demonstrated on Friday, hopefully. You can go to the grading server and get, get an idea of the automatic part of your grade. Your grade depends on human grading, local checks, and check stuff. Three different things. The human grading will happen only when the humans grade it. Okay? The other two parts combined together can be accessed to the grading server. And, and uh, how that's accessed, there's a PowerPoint that I have on grading server. And again, Andrew, on, on, during the recitations, will hopefully demonstrate that to you. Okay? So these are the tools available for checking. And it will give you a result like this. Okay? It will tell you, OK, here are the requirements. Here's how many points you got for all of this stuff. And, and so you can even get an idea of the automatic part of your grade. Okay? You can get points now, not just yes or no, but just points. Okay? So, um, so let's come to now object editor. So what's the problem that object editor tries to solve? If you notice, I layered the concepts and I said, you know, there's a dependency. And number seven is UI tool. That means UI toolkits you can't look at, understand really unless you've done six different things before that. Okay. UI toolkits are what allows you to create a GUI to your application. Now, what do you do if, you, if you're going to, so what if, so, you know, so what do you do if, if, if you have this dependency? 
Well, you can say there is no GUI. There's only this console-based UI to your applications. But the application I've chosen does have, you know, is, is a graphical application. It's a, it's a virtual environment in which you move avatars and shapes. So um, that is, you know, I'll have to change the assignment completely. And it, to, have an to have an assignment with no UI or at least no graphical UI seems, seems very backwards, okay? Um, not, some people just have console-based UIs, but it's just not satisfying, it's not modern, it's, and, 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 and you, you don't visualize things as well. Um, those of you who did Comp 110 with Chris Jordan, you guys had UIs, but what was that? He provided you with the UI code and you fit your code to his UI code, is that right? Okay. So you had to fit it exactly, I mean, you, you couldn't, there was, there was only so many choices you had because he called methods in your code. So there was very little creativity in, for instance, to display um, an avatar, okay? so in our, in our case. So, um, and, and he wrote a piece of code that was very assignment specific. Okay? So if he was to change assignments, he would have to change his code. Okay? So that's another alternative. Okay? But again, given that we, we, I want to encourage creativity here, that doesn't quite work out. Okay? And, and, and why use some code that is assignment specific? Why not create something, some more general tool? Okay? For those of you who did 401 with KMP, uh, what does he does is he doesn't have a UI for most of the initial assignments, and then he goes and adds a UI to this. So that's another alternative you could have done, but you just you do need to visualize your data structure at least in, in the projects that I have. In mind. Okay, so so that is 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 the problem, and the solution is that. You, it's, it's a sort of hybrid solution between KMPs uh, and, 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 and Chris's. So what you will do is you will get an automatically generated UI that is not assignment specific. That just takes an object. If the object is coded using well-defined rules, it will create a UI. Okay? So you have a UI for free. And that UI you can change with your own UI without changing any part of your code. In fact, this code doesn't even have an API. It just looks at your code just like a grader does and understands it and visualizes it and creates a UI. Okay, so eventually you'll be like KMP, you'll be building your own UI, but you'll be replacing an existing UI with a new UI. Okay? So that's what the project editor does. And you know, the one complaint people say is, but it's undocumented. And that's kind of true. It has only one AP, API line. You say object editor dot edit object. That's it. Okay? And it's hard to sort of forget this line. So what is undocumented about it? Well, the fact is that it requires you to follow certain style rules to create the UI. These are the same style rules that are needed for a human being to understand your code. So we are not talking about inventing new style rules. Well, sometimes we have to because those style rules don't quite exist in the literature. Okay, but you have to follow some conventions. Okay, and as long as you follow these conventions and these conventions are taught for each topic, then, then the object will be displayed correctly. Okay? And you'll often find, you know, people come and say, but my program works, you know, it's, it's object editor that's getting in my way, or it's the local checks getting in my way, or the UNC check style getting in my way. They're just the messengers. They're telling you what you're doing wrong so that you can correct them before you get your grade. Okay? So whole, the whole idea is to go and write code that is structured well enough that a tool can understand it, and if a tool can understand it, a human being can understand it. Okay? So that's the goal we're looking at. So keep remembering that how you program is very important in this class. Okay? It's not just input-output. Okay? And, and these, these are just tools that help you. Okay? Now, how the object is visualized is always specific. There's many ways to visualize a data structure. You're not graded on how the ob object is visualized. You know, the fact that you can visualize it is important enough is important for us because it means that we could understand your code, okay? And an API exists to go and modify the visualization too, and a lot of tools, students want that. They want it to look pretty, and I say, okay, here's the API. It doesn't, you don't lose points if you don't make it, uh, if it remains ugly, but you have a choice, okay? So um, what I've done is all the, the, these, the rules that it uses, I'm gonna be in trouble here. Okay, so I've been talking about research tools, about all of these tools. 
So even when Microsoft with its thousands of engineers produces software, or Google does, you know, you'll find oops of blue screen. So software will, will give you trouble. Okay? And already I have a student here who's telling, who's shown me that his output program work seems to work correctly, but the local text is complaining. So, um, so these things can fail and they're optional. If you find them not worth it, don't use them. Yeah, but I think you'll find them worth it. So there's none of the tools is really required. Object editor is kind of required. So some of your assignments require you to have the, the instructors to do some visual grading. Okay, so they, they look at the UI and try to figure out whether you did the right thing. And they look at the object editor UI. Because if you don't have a UI, we have to look at the object editor UI. So to that extent, object editor is required. Otherwise, even object editor is not required. So don't feel that you come to this class and you, you're being forced to deal with things that, that are quote unquote non-standard because they're research tools, they're non-standard. So this is just, just, it's just an option, okay? And because it's research, who knows what interesting things I might discover through, this, through these tools, okay? So what you'll find is a consent form uh, when you download things and it says, uh, you know, please, you've had to fill the, fill the consent form. So uh, that just means that some of the data that is collected by check style and by local checks, you know, how often you ran them, what output they gave, they are put in a file. In fact, that file is visible to you. If you look at, I think it's a checks file or something. There's a checks file. I mentioned in the PowerPoints, there's a particular folder in which this file is. You can even see what the data are, okay? And that file is now, uh, things will get recorded in that file. And we might at some point analyze it to just see perhaps, you know, did, did running check style improve your grade? Something like that. Or did it make no difference? Did the tools make a difference or not? We know the human beings don't make a difference. Maybe the tools don't make a difference either. Okay, and I kind of believe that too. Okay? Uh, so that's why there's a consent form. And we're not logging any of your Facebook interaction or anything else, just what check style and local checks are doing. And, and that data that we log are in that file. Can just see. Okay, it's just what output of, uh, what the output was. And also the recitation material. So there's also a link to the recitation page. So not only is the course page important, the Piazza page important, the Sakai, uh, your, your Sakai page in, uh, important, but also is the recitation page. This is managed by the TAs, okay? And whatever will be done each, uh, each week uh, will be, in the lesson for that week will be there uh, in, the, in the materials tab. There's also, so last time, the lec check style and local checks was the topic, and looks like we'll continue with that this week too a little bit, okay? Uh, we'll also add grading server to it. And there's also a rubrics tab, and that rubric tab tells you how your points are allocated, okay? So you'll see here that not everything here has to do with local checks, and there's probably a human element here too, okay? So for instance, in your next assignment, I require you to use a debugger. And, we, and to create some screenshots that show that you've used the debugger, okay? Um, so that's going to be tested, uh, tested by humans. Now, rubrics might change. You know, we might, we might decide that uh, this requires more weight now or this requires less weight. So this is just a hint. Most probably they won't change, but this is not guaranteed. And, and neither is the local checks points. Most probably we won't, we won't change them. But we might, after the fact, say, hey, everybody's having this problem. Let's go and reduce the points, okay? Uh, so let me just summarize. Uh, your obligations are to participate in class, to do something, okay? Fill the diary by the end of day on class activities and the diary stuff, you know, we haven't really done, I mean, today's class activities was very, were very few, the lecture, we didn't do any technical concept. So the diary is not important so far, okay? Um, but, um, and also now that I've seen that there's going to be class participation, people are going to ask questions, I know how many LAs there's, there's going to be, so now I can go and divide you guys uh, by LAs and ha assign each of you an LA, and once I assign to you an LA, then we'll have a way of reporting your diary. So that we'll post on Piazza and say, okay, this is how you report your diary. Yeah. Uh, where are you going to find the diaries? That's what I said. So we, you have a Piazza message saying how to go and fill your diary. Once I assign you to an LA. And I didn't want to assign you to an LA till I sort of saw what demand there was for LAs so that I could decide how many LAs should be in the class and how many should be outside in office hours. 
Okay, so after, this was actually very good. Everything happens for a reason. It was very good my computer went down because I could see the demand, okay? So, uh, so um, uh, what I'll ask Ken to do is basically go through the list. Now that we also, I think the class size is probably stable now. So we know how many students there are. We can go and divide them up by onions into, into, uh, into LAs. And then what you'll do is you'll post a Piazza message that you'll keep editing again and again in which you'll tag diary and you'll tag the name of your LA, okay? And that's a message you'll post and that message you'll keep editing each time you, you have with a, with a new date. Okay, you say, okay, on this date I did this and this is a private message. And Kent will post, a, will create a PowerPoint which tells you how to do a private message. Try to show you the steps required to fill the data. Okay? For now, just, you know, from next class onwards, if you don't have the instructions quite, at least in, in your own local file, just go and say what you did. And that, what you have to do, I mentioned earlier. You have to go and say what progress you made, what concept you learned. So just go look at that detail, what questions you answered, and, and that's the content. And that I did in a previous page, I don't, and you could just look at that, look that up, okay? So your obligation is to participate in class, fill the diary, you'll be graded on that, check course page for assignment due, okay? So assignment one is due on, th on Friday. Um, so make sure you get it done by then. Check the Sakai page for quizzes. There's a quiz due on, thur on Thursday night. Um, some of you have already finished it. By the way, there was one question that was, that had an error. So I, I made that zero points. And, that, and, and questions might have errors, so I will make them zero points rather than rephrase the question because some people do it earlier. So, um, and, and, and so that's, that's your obligation. Your resources are that go to the page, find the, find the topic, decide what resources you want to use. If you want to use the, uh, if you want to use the praxis, here, here's the, there, there'll always be a package name. That, uh, that, that, uh, and how to get to a package, uh, one student ha had a little trouble. So when you go to the, uh, we, we might provide you help but, uh, with, uh, with that. Um, I, don't know if, I don't have a screenshot here. But go to the package and you have the package all on the web and also in Git. So these are both web resources that you can go to sort of a special page I've created or you can go to the get, get, get directory. And uh, if you decide to do the praxis, you can just look at the praxis there. If you decide to do the praxis, then you have to go and import it into your Eclipse, okay? So, um, if you need help, check Piazza to see if question has been answered. If you ask a duplicate question, we might not answer it. Use Piazza if possible to ask a question that has not been answered. Ask in class if possible, because we are all here, and some of, at least one of us should be able to answer the question. And then go to office, okay? So that's, that's the plan.